everyone for attending today's meeting. Just a brief statement on the protocols to be followed during this remote meeting. Please note that the meeting has been broadcast live on YouTube and the recording will be made available for public viewing following the meeting. Can members please mute their microphones throughout the meeting when not speaking? This is important since it helps the quality of the audio for all present. Your microphone should be switched on when invited to speak and switched off when you're finished speaking. Please use the raised hand button to indicate that you wish to speak at any point. Can I ask that officers introduce themselves by confirming name and role before speaking for the first time on any item? If any members lose their connection or have any technical issues during the meeting, please alert the clerk as soon as possible, either using the chat function within the meeting or by email or phone. I'll now ask the clerk to carry out a roll call of the elected members participating in today's meeting. Thanks, Chair. If I can just confirm the panel members present. Councillor Davies? Uh, uh, yes, present. Councillor Farmer? Present. Councillor Houston? Present. Councillor McPherson? Here. Councillor McGill? Present. And Councillor Thompson? Present. OK, that's everyone present. Chair, we also have Councillor Earl present uh, to speak as a local member on the planning item. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, David. Move to item one on the agenda, which is apologies and substitutions, and I don't think there is any. Can you just confirm that, please? Yeah, no apologies or substitutions. Okay. Item two, declarations of interest. Any declarations to be made? No. Councillor Houston? Chair, I just want to register. I'm, I'm a member of the uh, uh, Integrated Joint Board of the Health and Social Care Partnership. Uh, and, and I say, say that only because it refers to a case for a, for a care home. There is no conflict of interest. I, I, I've been advised by our legal advisors. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. Councillor Houston, Councillor McGill. Echo the exact same that uh, Councillor Houston's just said. OK, Councillor Farmer. Yeah, that's the same for me, Chair. And just to say, I've got updated legal advice, so um, I, I don't see a conflict of interest. OK, thanks for that all. I'll be on to the first item on the agenda today, which is the construction and operation of the Shellach Wind Farm, including five wind turbines with associate access and infrastructure. And this is a hearing. And Dean <coughs> brooks Met is the officer who's going to reduce this before I'll ask Jane to introduce the report, just so that everybody's aware of the, the process for the hearing. The order of presentation is the introduction of the report by the planning officer, presentation by applicants, and that's limited to five minutes. This is the guidelines. It's not me stating that's the guidelines that's been given to me. Presentation by any supporters, again, that's limited to five minutes. Presentation by any objectors, five minutes. Now, I see there's actually two objectors speaking on this today, so they'll need to share the time. I've got a stopwatch here, so we monitor it and let everybody know. And presentation by any local members, and we've got Councillor Errol for the first one here, that's questions by the panel and consideration by the panel. So that's the running order of the hearing. Jane, do you want to introduce the application, please? Thank you, Chair. Just to introduce myself, my name's Jane Brooks Burnett and I'm Senior Planning Officer. If I could just share my screen. Can members see that image OK? Yep. Yes. Yeah. That's fine. So this proposal is for detailed planning permission sought by Force 9 Energy LLP and EDF Renewables to construct and operate a wind farm with the associated access and infrastructure. The wind farm is to comprise five turbines, two of which will have a maximum tip height of 180 metres and three will have a maximum tip height of 149.5 metres. Planning permission is sought to operate the wind farm for a 30 year period and it's a major application and has been accompanied by an environmental impact assessment. So this, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> first slide shows the site area where the turbines are to be located. Um, it's an area of open moorland and rough grazing. It lies approximately four and a half kilometres northeast of Fintry. So Fintry's down here. 
and approximately six kilometres south of Kippen. We've got Kippen up here. The site includes the northeast facing slopes of the backside Burn Valley on the, on the flank of the ridge that runs down from Strawn End. The site is drained by the Shell Burn and the Backside Burn. Maximum tip height of 180 metres, and three will have a maximum tip height of 149.5 metres. Planning Commission is thought to operate the wind Slide farm. two, access to the site is proposed to be taken from the north via the A811, which is the Stirling Arm Prior Road. When vehicles turn off the A811 to the site, um, road widening and realignment works are proposed to accommodate abnormal loads. Vehicles associated with this proposal are to turn south of Tarn Fire from the A811 onto the C36 Furs Road, where they will continue to the junction where the road meets the B822, which is the Kippen Fintry Road at Kippen Muir. At this point, traffic will travel along the B822 um, to the access at Gribloch, Gribloch Farms. So that's approximately 1.3 kilometres. Vehicles will then travel along an upgraded access road to Gribloch. Gribloch is about here, um, where a new road will skirt west of the farm, going south to meet Glynn's Road. At this point, vehicles will travel along Glynn's Road to the access to Easter Glens. We're here. Um, and like Gribloch, they'll skirt round the west of um, that farmhouse and come up the spout of Balakleem to the site. Side three I just included to provide a pictorial indication of how the blades will be transported to the site and what an abnormal load would look like. It's an articulated vehicle that comprises a tractor unit, an extendable trailer, and the blade will overhang the trailer by about 15 metres. The total length of the abnormal load for transporting the blades is 75 metres, and for the base tower section, it's 40 metres. Once the load has been delivered to the site, the vehicle can retract to an HGV for the return journey. So the next slides I'm going to show you show the works to the road network along with site photographs. So this one is, the, so we have here to the, the road to the north is the A811. And this road coming here is the access that goes down to Portman Teeth. So the current access onto Furs Road is here. And the proposal is to have um, a new access coming off the A811. There's mature trees along here, so this access avoids those mature trees. It then has a new part through a field to avoid this tight corner. Then it's rising up as you come up the hill past Hardiston Farm. And then again, to avoid this corner, there's an area where we're crossing the field again with a new access track. This is the view at Arn Prior. So um, just in the foreground here, you've got the road that goes down to Portman Teeth. Here are the mature trees that I mentioned and the access proposed, um, the new access proposed is in here. The current access is about here in this picture and the road runs up here. I think you could probably just make out a van on the road. This is just another view so you can see um, the field that it's going to be coming across. And then this is the road uh, coming up from Arm Prior, and you can see this is the point where the M um, I had highlighted would be crossing part of a field. And this is Hardiston Farm that I mentioned, and the the next point, the road comes up here, and the proposal is to cut across this field here. We're now this is the Furs Road um, coming up onto Kippen Muir. And there's the junction here that we have. We've got Kippen off to the north and the Fintry Road down to the south. And the proposal is to have a new access to avoid this tight corner here. So there's woodland in this area and the access, the new access will be north of that woodland. Here's the view of that looking across the area. So there's the woodland I pointed out and the access will be coming across here. 
And then this is just in context, so you can see um, the, the, the Kippen Road there. So this is the Kippen Road coming along here, and the access off to Gribloch Farm currently is here. And the proposal is just to um, smooth off that access. It's quite it's quite a, a, a kind of um, dog leg coming back from Kippen. So um, turning off the main road and then now moving on to private track. Private track cr currently serves Dribloch and runs all the way up to the Easter Glens Road, which is down here. So the proposal is to utilise the existing track that goes to Gribloch Farm, but just north of Gribloch to go west of, oh, sorry, to go west of Gribloch Farm, avoiding the farm itself, joining briefly back onto an existing track and then coming up onto uh, Glynn's Road. So it's just avoiding the Glynn's Road junction by a new access across this part of field, which is shown here. So you can just see up on the, the hill here, we've got Griblock Farm. Current access comes along here and um, is just proposed to come across this field at this point. So this is um, the Glynn's Road, which is a single track public road. Um, that goes essentially from sort of almost at Fintry and then comes out on the A811 down at um, by Bahuan mm. area. So the proposal is to come off this road again, um, going west of the current uh, Easter Glens farm and then up through the hill and up the spout of Balachlim. Here's a photograph just of the Glynn's Road. This is a um, public road, but as you see, it's little used um, single track road. We've just got more view of it. Now, this is the um, East Glynn's farmhouse, just indicating um, where west they'll be going. So the, the area of the, the, the site that we're looking at is up here. And this is just a, another view of the farm. So this is um, up the back of the farm coming through the spout of Balach Leem, and then the new access track will come into the site at this point here to the northeast. Then this is within the site. And so if I just run through what we have on the screen, so obviously okay. red lines the boundary. This little bit here is the northern access track. Uh, the blue line is the proposed internal access road. We've got the anemometer mast located here. The proposed construction compound is the pink. The control building is blue. The proposed area of hard standing next to the turbines you'll see is this sort of um, sandy colour. Um, area where proposed borrow pits are is this brown. Turning heads are these little outshots here along the access track. There's a holding area up to the north here for the abnormal loads and the blue dots are the watercourse crossings. This is just views of the site looking across the site. I included this particular slide just because I thought it was useful for members to get a feel for the topography of the area. So the blue area indicates the lower lying land. So you can see um, you know, we've got Arn Pryor and Kippen, which is lower lying into and then I think it's useful just to highlight how the hill structure is. You can see the green areas rising up through the orange and then the, the higher areas are the red. So you can see where the turbine location is between these two higher peaks in the Fintry and the Garganic Hills. So um, we're looking at the Fintry Hills are about um, 482 above Ordnance Datum. You've got um, Ling Hill here, 412, Gargunic Hills, um, 485. So this is the um, peak there. You'll note also this is one of the viewpoints that was in the um, Landscape Visual Impact Assessment, this particular viewpoint here. So um, turbines one and two here, um, are, they sit at about 310 above ordnance datum, whereas turbines three, and four, three, four and five to the west are about 375. And so it's quite clear 
how they sit between these two peaks. Now, this slide, I think, provides useful um, information in terms of the other wind farms within the area. It's a good overview. So we've got Kingsburn here to the north. That's nine turbines of 115 metres. Earlsburn to the east is 15 turbines of 110 metres. Craig and Gelt down here is eight turbines of 125 metres and Craig Annett Hill is a single turbine of 102. And it's, I think, just to sort of say to members, it's useful if you just note where Kingsburn and Earlsburn are, because when we come to look at the further slides of uh, visual impact from, say, Portman Teeth area, then these are the turbines that you'll see in those slides. So. And the next few slides I'm going to come on to were taken by my policy colleague who visited a number of locations where the wind farms likely to be visible. And they're generally locations assessed by the applicant in the landscape and visual impact assessment. But I thought they're just useful uh, images for context. So this one is from, um, as you can see, from David Marshall Lodge looking across. So that's the view that we currently have, as you can see on the on the hill here, you can already see the Earlsburn and Craig and Gelt turbines. This is Portman Teeth view. Um, so the proposal we are looking at is in here, and you can see that the turbines are are visible on that skyline. Just looking across the Lake and Teeth there. So um, this one is Tom Tain, and you can you can see um, the Cannon Valley Reservoir here, and the view across the site. So that's the single turbine, I think, at Craig Annett that we can see. Um, and I'm taking it, that must be Craig and Gelt. And then we've got the other, the um, Earlsburn, etc., further on the horizon there. Right. This is Easter Cringate view. We've got other. Right. So now we're on to the zone of theoretical visibility to blade tip. So um, the pink area represents where five tips are visible. The blue area is where three tips are visible and the green area is where one or two tips are visible. And we've got a number of viewpoints that this is taken from. So just to give members a bit of um, get their bearings here. We've got Easter Cringate over here. We've got Sir John Le Graham's Castle. We've got the Crow Road at number three. And where's four? Pern Leather. And they, oh, there it is up there. So that's that's the um, high point on the Gargunic Hills that I was highlighting earlier. We've got Tom Tain down here. Um, Kippen Muir, which is, um, if you recall, that's where the uh, new road junction was that I indicated before. Um, we've got um, Easter Garden, which is out at Arn Prior area. Ruski is up here at number eight. And this viewpoint is taken from a high level that um, if people know that at particular Aberfoyle Road, it's where you're coming along, <clears throat> heading towards Aberfoyle. <clears throat> excuse me. And there's clear views off to your left, to the south, right across Flanders Moss before the road then goes down into uh, Ruski. And then along here, there's the calendar turn off, the Arn Prior turn off, and number nine at Portman Teeth is um, on that Aberfoyle Road. So as you can see from that, there's a sort of um, cone of influence to the north towards Portman Teeth, um, where you can see the five turbine tips. And then there's, uh, as that cone widens out, the impact is reduced in terms of the visual impact where it goes down to three to four tips at this point and at one to two and the, as you can see there's large areas to the east and west where the tips will not be visible um, and then the other part that it's quite contained within is over the Fintry Gargonic Hills here because obviously these are the high a much higher point and then again to the, to the areas to the south So we're now looking at the zone of theoretical visibility to um, blade tip height, but this is a much wider area that we're looking at. So 
Um, right. We can see, I'm just trying to get my bearings here. Um, so, yeah, we've got Easter Garden, Arm Prior here. This is the um, Ruski Portman Teeth. When we get out here, this is the David Marshall Lodge. So this is the um, area where my colleague also took a photograph from. Um, ben Leddy is up in this area. Calendar is at this point. Sheriff Muir is over here. We've got, I'm just trying to find all the different ones. Uh, Croft Tammy is this point here. And I think the, the, the last one is probably the Falkirk Quill, which is out at this point here. So as you can, that gives a sort of wider area. You can see the sort of cone um, to the north where the blade tips are visible. Now we're looking at the zone of theoretical visibility to hub height. So once you get to the hub height, this means that from these points, you'll be able to see the full length of the turbine blade from the hub as it turns. So that's really, so, so you're sort of um, seeing further down the turbine and that's why that there's been a reduction in, in the area that you can see that from. So it's more concentrated around um, Portman Teeth here at number nine. So where you see the full blade rotating, this is the um, Portman Teeth, we'll see that. And then from Ruski to Portman Teeth, we'll be within the area of three to four. And one to two is between an area at Thornhill towards Ruski. You'll also see it from high points to the north, such as Ben Leddy. And you'll see that within the sort of more confined areas of the hill at Gargonic and Fintry, areas to the south um, have, have um, less impact there. So what I've done in terms of the slides I've um, chosen today for members to view is that I've considered the, the views from Portum and Teeth, because as you could see from the previous slides, this is the area where there would be the greatest influence in terms of um, landscape and visual impact. So given that this area, you could see the five blades, whereas to the east or west of this, it was reduced. So I've taken the worst case scenario that I could from, which is from Port of Monteith. Um, so this, this slide I've used just to identify where the viewpoint is taken from. So we've got the road down to Arn Prior here and um, the school, the road going along to Aberfoyle, road to sort of Thornhill, Calendar up here, just to give some context and members can see you've got the Lake and Teeth to the south. So in terms of the view, um, this is the view from that um, viewpoint, but this is just really there for context. And you can see, just point, see out the spire of Portman Teeth Kirk right here, Lake and Teeth, and we're looking over in this particular direction towards where the development is. And as you'll see from the wire uh, wireframe image below, this is the Shellach Wind Farm proposal shown here in blue, and the existing uh, Earlsburn, Kingsburn um, turbines are, are in this area. So this is the um, photo montage, which is um, shows if you were to hold this at, at arm's length, um, would would give you a good view of what that would look like. So you can see this is more likely the view that you would see. Um, we've got uh, Port McTeeth Kirk here, Lake McTeeth in front, and it, the the turbines have been superimposed onto this view, and members may. See, see those turbines there um, and you can see the uh, Earlsburn turbines here. So I would say though that generally in my experience when I've looked at these things before and after development that the eye tends to um, pick out these images more clearly than I would say is displayed here. So um, you can see um, here we have the Shellach uh, turbines in here and the arrows burn. So I think it's more like this, I think that you'll see the eye tends to, to pick these things out uh, more readily than I think they're shown in the image. Now, a rather blurred image here, and I apologize for that, but what I've done is I've just taken the part 
of the photomontage and blown it up so that members can see what it is. This is not an image that you will actually see, but it's just really um, a little bit more information for members. So the other um, thing that there was, was um, aviation lights on turbines. So obstacles that are in excess of 150 metres need to have aviation warning lights installed on them. That's a requirement <coughs> under legislation. So turbines one and two are therefore um, going to have the aviation lights installed. And this zone of theoretical visibility just indicates in, in theory, where you could see these aviation lights for, and with all these images that have shown where it's a theoretical visibility, that's not taking into account buildings, trees, um, other um, obstacles to view. It's just looking at it in terms of um, uh, heights and where you're likely to see it from. So in terms of that, the the where you can see two hub lights is within the Portman Teeth area um, and going sort of towards Aberfoyle, this area here, and also within the Fintry uh, Gargunic Hills area. And um, less, you will see them, but, but one uh, light from the Blair Hoyle towards Portman Teeth. And this is a, the, the this um, slide has been included because it's about the intensity of the aviation light that would be visible. So as I've set out in my report, that the lighting that's going to be installed on the turbines is really lighting that's going to be required for obviously for aviation. So it's going to be seen at a different height. That um, and it's not necessarily it's not necessary that the light is seen from these lower levels. So the as the um, light is viewed from different angles, the intensity reduces and that um, intensity would also reduce over distance. So um, as you can see, the the areas where um, it's more intense tends to be are these higher areas within the Tuch and Fintry Hills um, and then the higher areas, Ben Lady, etc., to the north. And although you will see it from uh, Aberfoyle, Portman Teeth area and um, down towards Flanders Moss, the intensity of that light will be reduced. Now, um, this image is the aviation lighting and I'm just I think this was the worst case scenario one. Um, yeah, this is um, the worst case scenario that the applicant had included within the landscape visual impact assessment for aviation lighting. And it's the views seen from Portman Teeth across the Lake and Teeth. And you can see um, turbine one and two highlighted there. In reality, though, they say that the lighting will be more like that. Now, you can see there's already this, the, a sort of glow in the sky from Central Belt, Glasgow area. Um, so. Now, I included this particular image because it's the Todd Holes Cairn and that's referred to in my report. Um, allow members to see the effect Historic Scotland had referred to when they stated that the impact on the setting of the cairn would be moderate rather than minor, as described by the developer, though it should be noted that Historic Environment Scotland did not object to the proposal. But I just thought that would be useful for members to see um, the impact. And finally, on to one of my last slides. So the cairn, just for members' interest, is down there. Um, so what this image shows is it's just superimposing one proposal on the other. So um, so it's just showing um, the previously consented development, which we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven turbines, and this proposal, which is the one 
two, three, four, five turbines. Um, and I just thought it's useful for members to see what was um, previously approved. Now, the, there was previously approved this access track and then subsequently a, a north access track was then approved before the this particular application was submitted. So um, just really for members to note that turbines three, four and five, um, they are sitting at about, um, so, so there, three, four and five are 149.5 um, metres high and they sit at, they're sitting at a higher level at about 380, 400 AOD, um, whereas the approved turbines five and six, which are 125 metres high, were only at 350 um, AOD. So the, uh, the recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to the inclusion of conditions listed within Appendix 1. I understand Michael's just wanting to highlight some changes that we were looking um, to have to those conditions. But otherwise, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. OK, thanks for that, Jen. And Mike, do you want to come in at that point there and just obviously Jen's mentioned that? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you, Chair. So, uh, Michael Mulgrew, Development Management Team Leader. Um, it's just to highlight to members today that in the event that panel agrees to approve the application, um, is to ask for delegated authority to reword um, the wording of conditions 1 and 42, um, just to ensure that cumulative development is adequately controlled. Um, and just for members' awareness, conditions 1 and 42 relate to the time period for consent and the existing consent that Jane mentioned. So it's just so that we've got adequate wording um, to control um, any impacts from cumulative development and to ensure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. OK, Mark Keeson from Legal Team, do you want to speak, please? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, Councillor McPherson and other panel members, sorry, just to, to jump in, I spoke to, to Mike about this yesterday and it's my mistake. It should actually be condition 2 and 42 that are the, the, the delegations rather than 1 and 42 um, regarding the cumulative impact assessments. So just to, to clarify that point. OK, that's fine. Thanks. That move to the second part of the, the hearing, which is the presentation by the applicant. And we have Andrew Smith who's speaking about the, on behalf of the applicant. And uh, Mr. Smith, uh, again, I'm bound by the rules of allowing five minutes, so I've got a stopwatch here. If you want to make your presentation after four minutes, I'll ask you to start to sum up. Okay. So please proceed. Good, good morning, members. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Good, good. Um, I'm the Head of Planning and Development with Force 9 Energy. Um, the Shellac proposal comes forward on the site of the consented Creighton Hospital Hill Wind Farm. This is a key consideration. The site is already considered acceptable for wind farm development under council policy. The only matter is which, which is therefore before members is whether the proposed redesign introduces exceptional effects beyond those already considered acceptable taking account of the benefits of the development. I want to set out the balance of issues very clearly and succinctly. The Scottish Government has set itself a legally binding target to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2045, one of the most ambitious climate change programmes in the world. To support this, the Government is reviewing its onshore wind and planning policies, which are currently out for consultation. The draft onshore wind policy seeks additional onshore wind capacity of up to 12 gigawatts within eight years by 2030. Considering that since the first onshore wind farm was installed in 1995, there have been 8.4 gigawatts of capacity installed in Scotland in 26 years, the measure of Scottish government ambition is clear. NTF4 will support this ambition and will recognise the climate emergency as a key material planning consideration. Its draft policies combine to support projects like Scheller. The direction of travel in these documents is unambiguous. Onshore wind farm development must be supported to contribute to the decarbonisation of our economy, homes and transport systems as part of Scotland's legally binding commitments on net zero. The project design will get the best out of the wind resource on the site, generating over 80% more electricity from two less turbines compared with the consented project by using modern, efficient turbine designs. The carbon payback time for the project is one and a half years, meaning it will be carbon positive 
for 28 and a half of its operational years. Shellac represents almost a £30 million investment into the sterling economy, and we expect sterling businesses to benefit from about £2.5 million spend in the local area. We expect to support a workforce of 30 through the construction period, and the project will generate four jobs during its 30-year operational period. We have consulted extensively with local communities using an innovative online platform during the pandemic, which included interactive materials. The project comes with an offer of both shared ownership, which some community groups are actively looking at, and separately, a community benefit of £5,000 per megawatt per annum. That equates to an index-linked community benefit pot of £3.6 million over the project lifetime. We have already agreed with communities that benefit will be split equally six ways within our community of interest, representing the closest community council areas to the site. That will give each of the six community councils £600,000 over the project lifetime to spend on community-focused projects. Your officer has already reported the effects of the proposed redesign are not so significantly different from the already consented project to warrant refusal of planning permission, which mirrors the approach we took to project design. The balance of issues on the application is therefore clear. The benefits of the development significantly outweigh any adverse effects and the project is supported and in fact encouraged by current and emerging policy. Many thanks for the opportunity to address the panel this morning. I'm very happy to deal with any questions you have about the project. OK, thanks for that, Mr Smith. You have actually just over four minutes there and you've, you've, you're entitled to use any unused time at the end of this if you if you wish to do that. OK, so you have a minute after, later on. OK, move Thank to you. the next section of the, the hearing is the presentation by supporters. And we have David King speaking on behalf of Gargunnock Community Council. Mr King, I'll repeat what I said there to Mr Smith. Could you limit your presentation to five minutes? And I'll ask you to sum up after four. If you want to proceed, thank you. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. Whilst the local community views of the acceptability or otherwise of the development can be based on a variety of factors, Gargunnock Community Council recognises that the decision of the planning authority will rely exclusively on material planning con considerations. As a general principle, the Community Council is supportive of the development of renewable energy as it reduces the carbon footprint of electricity generation. The proposed development will generate electricity from a renewable source and based on the applicant's assessment, will produce 84% more energy than the previously consented development with two fewer turbines and consequently will contribute to the Scottish Government's greenhouse gas reduction targets. With regard to whether this is an appropriate location, the proposed development is in an area identified in the local development plan as potentially suitable for additional turbines. <clears throat> in our view, it is also preferable to locate additional turbines adjacent to existing wind farms so as to limit the proliferation into other areas which may be more environmentally sensitive. The existence of the previous permission for the Clayton and Spitalhall wind farm, which was established, which, which has established the precedent that a wind farm is an appropriate development in this location, is significant, as, as is the possibility that the developer will revert to his previous proposal if the present application fails. In our view, the current proposed development is preferable to the previously consented development. The planning application is accompanied by an environmental impact assessment prepared in accordance with the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland regulations to identify the likely significant environmental effects of the development and determine what measures will be implemented to mitigate these effects where necessary. It is common for wind farm developments to result in significant landscape and visual effects due to their nature as tall and made structures in the landscape. The applicant believes that the significant environmental effects of the development have been mitigated as far as reasonably possible through an extensive process of design iteration. 
it is recognised that there will be some environmental impact due to the higher blade height and minor westward extension on the Fintry Hills. However, in general, this impact will not be visible from Cardonic Village. In relation to the earlier King, Kingsburn wind farm located adjacent to the proposed development, the Community Council at that time had taken the view that the generally undulating moorland of the Gargunic and Fintry Hills was not an area of high scenic value that needed stringent protection. It is considered that the cumulative impact of the proposed development and the adjacent existing wind farms will not be sufficient to override that previous view. The relatively small number of additional turbines is an advantage in this connection. The location of the proposed development is not on productive agricultural land. Around six kilometres of new track will be required to access the wind farm. Public road widening and or alignment works on the C3, sorry, the C, the C36 Furs Road and the B822 will also be necessary to accommodate abnormal loads during construction. Construction traffic will also use the A811. Any disruption would be temporary and if properly managed, it's not considered that it would cause problems for Gargunic residents or general travel in the area. There have been no significant negative impacts on the village from the existing Earlsburn and Kingsburn wind farm developments. So the addition of five more turbines would not be expected to create any future concern. The Gargunic Community Council has actively communicated... You have a minute, you have a minute left. A minute left, Mr King. Okay, the Gargunic Community Council has actively communicated details of the proposed development to Gargunic residents and had previously pointed residents towards the developer's public consultation. At the request of two Gargunic residents who felt that the initial public consultation was not long enough to allow consideration of the proposed development, Gargunic Community Council approached the developer who agreed to extend the consultation by two weeks. Gargunic Community Council has received input from one local resident who is concerned about the next negative visual impact. However, despite a campaign by this individual, we have received only one other comment from a resident supporting this concern. Gargunic Community Council has received a submission from Gargunic Community Trust, a charity with the stated purpose of supporting Gargunic residents on the proposed development. This submission includes a detailed assessment of the proposed wind farm development and concludes with a statement that Subject to all necessary mitigating measures, the Organic Community Trust supports the proposed Shell Wind Farm planning application. Other informal comments from residents have related okay. to ensure the exit. You need to start finishing up, Mr. Mr. King. Uh, I have the, two points, sorry. Um, the developer has agreed to work with Stirling Council to generate a public access management plan that will reduce disruption to users of these paths. The developer has stated that the operation of the proposed development will not prevent people from visiting the area. And finally, there will be a robust planning obligation to ensure decommissioning and site restoration at the end of the 30-year projected life of the wind farm. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. You're about 45 seconds over there, which I'm going to add on to the time for the objectors. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next section, which is for the objectors. Now, we've got two here. We've got John Paul Wilkinson, I've got Kate Sankey, and again, I don't know whether or not you've already collaborated, but you know, I need to split the time there. You'll have five minutes, 45 seconds, given the when the Mr. King went over there. So I don't know who wants just, to go first um, here. Just, just to, to clarify before we start, um, we were told that it was five minutes per contributor, not for overall objectors, and, and we haven't been given an agenda telling us how many objectors there, there are. So. We, I've prepared a five-minute statement, and I believe well, Kate Sankey has done that. That's definitely not the case. So you, you're I, can, okay. I, I can confirm that also, and we had a meeting so that we were not going to uh, duplicate uh, points. So right, uh, okay. I'm just going. To, well, that's not the case. But I'm just going to clarify with the legal officer of the council. Did there somebody want for the just to confirm that, please? It's five minutes combined. Does anybody want to? Chris Cox, do you want to comment on that? You just obviously the planning toolbox is part of your room. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it is the procedures of that are set out in the toolbox. That is a combined five minutes. Um, and I, I could ask Jane or Mike to confirm what was um, the communication with the the objectors. Um, the the chair does have some discretion over that if there's um, if there's reason. Um, but usually there would have to be um, 
you know, we're usually looking for objectors or supporters to combine within the yep. five minutes. Okay, well, on that base, I'm strictly going by the guidelines I've been given in the, in the planning toolbox states five minutes combined. I'm, however, happy to give you three minutes each if that helps. So if Mr Wilkinson or Mr Sankey wants to go first. I'll, I'll go first and I'll, I'll be quick. Okay. I'll read quickly then. Um, Thank okay. you. Good morning, panel. I'd like to object to, to the development as a Stirling Council resident who lives just outside the village of Thornhill. I'd like to list a number of objections using Stirling Council's um, wind energy developments guidance to support my case. Um, the Council's guidance states that there is very little capacity for turbines under 110 metres tall and no capacity for turbines over 110 metres. The Shellock turbine proposed are 149 and a half metres and 180 metres tall. 180 metres is over 60% higher than what is deemed un unacceptable by the Council. To put it into perspective, 180 metres is three times the height of the Wallace Monument, and we all know how prominent a landmark that is. With regard to landscape and visual effects, Stirling Council's guidance refers to particular sensitivity of the Stirling area and states that, I quote, Fourth Valley and surrounding hills tend to be experienced as a single landscape composition rather than individual features, and that there remains very little capacity for further wind farm development of varying scales within this area if the intrinsic qualities of the landscape are to be maintained. The proposed development site sits at the centre of a rolling hillscape that runs from Gargunnock to Dumgoyne. Together with views of Ben Ledy on the other side of the valley, it's part of a stunning 360 degree panorama from the Castle of Stirling, which is enjoyed by thousands of visitors and those living in surrounding villages. It's by no means a wind turbine dominated landscape. Currently only part of one smaller turbine in Fintry is visible on this side of the Kippen Hills. This isn't a case of extending an existing wind farm. It's a destruction of an unspoilt landscape. I will again refer back to um, Stirling Council's own wind farm guidance, which specifically refers to distinct hill edges and panorama of the cast. Capacity mainly defined by whether a wind turbine would be seen either against or above hill edge, its relative size, and whether it relates or impinges upon the distinctive qualities of this edge. A wind farm development of shelf size would sit above the hill edge, breaking the horizon and destroying this stunning landscape with an industrial scale development. It would be an unacceptable landscape change and would be completely out of proportion with the rolling hill setting. At the consultant stage, the artist's impressions presented by the developer showed distant white turbines against cloudy skies, but subsequent pictures show 180 meter turbines with fixed four red aviation warning lights. These will be positioned across the tower and the hub to ensure that they're clearly visible to aircraft from all directions. You have to ask yourself, why did initial visualizations not include these red beacons? These turbines will not simply blend into the landscape. They'll be lit up and seen from miles around. Not only that, but they'll sit prominently above the horizon and will be clearly visible day and night with red lights illuminating the moving blades. Communities have a right to be properly consulted. I would argue that the Council's reasons for rejecting the first application for a wind farm on this site in 2015 are more pertinent to this application. It was rejected on the grounds of scale, proximity to hill edges, visual dominant impact. The visual harm of these much smaller 125 metre turbines was deemed significant and unacceptable by this, this planning department. What's changed in the last five years to suddenly make a much taller illuminated development okay? especially when we now have a giant solar farm developed uh, development plan for Gargunnock to help council meet its green energy aims. The size scale layout of the proposed development would not have a huge, would not only have a hugely negative impact on the landscape for decades to come, it would damage tourism and the local economy, which desperately relies on this source of income. Given the ongoing COVID-19 situation, our small rural villages need all the help they can get to preserve and protect the beauty of our local landscape and attract visitors. While I think we all appreciate the um, climate change emergency, we're also facing an economic emergency and local tourism needs to be supported rather than stripped of its natural assets. I would therefore urge the council to reject this application on behalf of its communities and not ignore its own guidance. Thank you. OK, thanks a lot, Mr. Wilkinson. Ms. Sankey, you have two minutes, please, if you want to proceed. OK, I will move on to uh, my, my second point. I absolutely concur with what has just been said. Um, I run a, a tourism business and the visitors to the areas, including, to, including my, my yurts, enjoy dark skies and the two red lights, however dim, will ensure a 24-hour experience, an unwelcome reminder of the creeping impact of industrialised landscapes 
and the visitor experience will be miserably diminished just at a time when people are more sensitive to wild land and are looking to seek solace in the countryside and the natural world. So carbon and the natural resources, the damage to the peat soils of such a massive construction site is a very significant, but is being played down by the developer. We now know just how important peatland restoration is and how easy it is to destroy, and with it, tons of carbon is lost to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Why sanction yet more peat loss in Stirlingshire for a dubious return of 1.1 million tonnes carbon dioxide saved over 30 years? whatever that means. And just for comparison, Flanders Moss National Nature Reserve stores 11 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. I asked for an explanation of what was included in the carbon audit payback figures quoted. None has been provided. The carbon calculator used by the developers uh, carbon report is formulaic, but does not account for the embedded carbon costs of fabrication, nor does it include, by the developer's own admission, anything for the construction, which you've heard is a massive job, of the access roads or for the HGV's um, uh, carbon cost in the construction. Can you, can, you start to, can you start to sum up, please? We have 30 seconds. The, the statistics and figures produced by consultants for developer have resulted in an abstraction of reality and no account taken of real value. Uh, just finally, the wildlife report is very, very thin. Curlew and black grouse are mentioned because they happen to be in an unfavorable conservation status. They say eight to 15 pairs of curlews will be at risk. This is incredibly significant locally and nationally, given the plight of these ground nesting birds whose breeding population in the UK has halved in the, in the past 25 years. Hen harriers are mentioned, but didn't, make, didn't get past the scoping study. Yeah. They are the one bird of prey that's on the decrease and a scoping study said they saw three, two of which would be at risk. Significant, I would say. So all in all, um, the wildlife report is, is, is very thin and, and should be and, and inadequate. And I've, okay. I've run out. OK, thanks very much for, for the objectors for that. And, and obviously we're over time there. I'm going to afford Mr. Wilkinson, sorry, Mr. Smith, an extra minute on if he wants it on to the extra the other unused minute I had at the end. OK, so we'll move, move to the last section of the hearing, which is a presentation by local members. We've got Councillor Errol. Councillor Errol, if you want to make your presentation and to abide by the Councillor's Code of Conduct, I've been told obviously you need to leave the meeting after your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so good morning, panel. I am representing my serious concerns and those of many others across two community council areas of my ward. As recognised in the report, these two locations will see the greatest negative impact of these huge turbines the applicant is seeking to locate in an area that already has 33, as indicated by the officer presentation, in place. These five huge wind turbines will have significant visual and, and landscape impacts on large areas of my ward. They are so big they need aircraft warning lights and interfere with radar. The area is already substantially contributing towards renewable energy and net zero targets with both the existing turbines and the solar wind farm. This week, we have just heard the major announcement of 17 offshore wind developments in the Scott Wind project that is rebalancing the need for onshore wind farms. Adding these giants to the landscape here is not appropriate or justifiable. All existing turbines are no taller than 125 metres. The previous application that was refused by this planning authority in 2015 only sought that as a maximum turbine height. That previous application was originally refused on the grounds of limited landscape capacity, visual effect and being contrary to the LDP. None of these factors have changed. With the increase in turbine size proposed, they have become even more pertinent. Given the significant increases in turbine size now being proposed, the reporter's comments supporting the approval on appeal of the previous application should not be a material consideration used to support recommend approval for this application. The supplementary guidance for wind energy development states that there is no capacity for very large turbines over 110 metres in this proposed area. This proposal is contrary to that supplementary guidance. 
The proposed larger turbines will significantly disrupt the horizon and hill edges as seen from the north and has uh, <coughs> explained in the officer presentation. This will be exacerbated by the movement of these turbines. Being sighted on high ground, the turbines will be visible over a wide area. <coughs> Excuse me. Both the National Park and Nature Scott refer to this impact, with Nature Scott advising that there may be significant adverse effects and eye-catching lights, especially from the north. Both existing and draft national planning frameworks advise that if impacts identified are unacceptable, then proposals for wind farms should not be supported. Supplementary guidance states there remains very little capacity for further wind farm development of varying scales within the study area if the intrinsic qualities of the landscape are to be maintained. Low capacity is defined as a landscape that is both highly sensitive to wind turbine development and as a high value, where only a slight level of change can be accommodated without significantly adversely affecting any of the key defining characteristics of that landscape. The justification to support approval in the report is based largely on the approximated increase in generating capacity. The amount of energy being generated should not be used as a mitigating factor. Unacceptable is unacceptable. The previous 2015 proposal was refused by the Council due to skyline, hill edge and landscape character. The reporter considered that significant landscape or visual impacts would arise at a distance to the north. These are areas around Portamonteith and Thornhill Community Council areas as indicated. The report clearly states that these are the areas that are, we will be the most impacted. It further states that the overall height and rotor diameters have now significantly increased from the previous application and there will be noticeable increases in the magnitude of landscape and visual impacts compared with the reporter consented scheme. I believe it is significant that the applicant has decided that neither of these communities should be eligible for any community benefit funds. Mr Wilson spent time telling you how the communities are going to benefit. Neither of these two community council areas will get a penny because this developer has decided they're not eligible. I would have to suggest that had they done so, they would have openly acknowledged that there is a significant impact from their development in these areas and they chose not to do so. I think this, although not a material consideration, is significant and I am extremely concerned about that. Given the accepted negative visual impacts of these localities, then that surely would justify refusal under the draft of policies and guidance that would support such a decision. Should the panel not feel able to refuse the application today, I would urge you to postpone any decision and take an unaccompanied site visit to assess for yourselves the impact on these areas identified in the report from a number of agreed viewpoints. This will provide you with far better and clearer assessment than the montages supplied. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Councillor Rumble. And move, move now from, for questions from panel members to Council officers and any of the contributors today. Any questions? OK, I have a couple of questions if nobody else has. Jane, in, in relation to the extant planning consent, obviously the Councillor Earl says it shouldn't be a planning consideration, the, the appeal, but that's, not, that's clearly not the case, to be honest with you. The appeal was granted. In relation to the reporter's error that's mentioned in there, how, how did that come to light and who found out about that? It's been highlighted in the submission by the applicant. So when they submitted the planning application, it was within their planning statement. OK, so that wasn't a judicial review or anything that found this out then, no, this error from the reporter. It just seems very strange that the reporter got it wrong. That, that, that is correct. The reporter did get it wrong. And I have to say it's not on the it's not an unusual circumstance. Having looked into it a bit more, um, I note that the same error has occurred within other local authority areas and um, similar to ourselves. Um, they just had to accept the situation. 
OK, thanks for that, Jane. I've a question now for Andrew Smith. M Mr Smith, obviously the councillor will refer to this as well, and I'm not going to get into the all issue about a potential bond fight over money, because that's not a planning consideration here, but you, you did mention the £30 million pound investment, 30 construction jobs, four jobs throughout the 30 years, £3.6 million pound to communities, mm -hmm. 600 grand. The six hundred thousand pound over six community. Can you give us a bit more information on the, the the investment and the jobs, please? Sure. Um, the investment for the the wind farm about fifty percent of that is is the purchase of of wind turbines. Um, but on these shores, um, that money will be spent on transportation and there are uh, numerous transportation businesses in Scotland that, that are likely to benefit from uh, the project um, and about 50% of it goes towards um, the construction of the wind farm and there are several specialist construction businesses in Scotland that are um, experienced and well placed to win contracts, major contracts associated with the wind farm, supporting jobs within those businesses and supporting those businesses um, to, to, to gain even more experience and, and expand their portfolio um, of construction related matters. And that principal contract then bleeds down into more localised contracts. Um, so some of the habitat management that we are planning to restore peatland in the area is likely to be carried out by peat specialists um, local to the area. If we require fencing contracts, fencing contracts are likely to go into the local area and there'll be people on site. People on site mean they'll be travelling to and from the area and spending um, quite a considerable amount of money um, on their lunch, <laughs> on, on fuel, on um, all the, the normal day-to-day -day expenditure. Um, now, as you add that up and multiply it through standard economic um, multipliers, you come to conclusions about what that means in terms of jobs. And our specialists who presented the economic case so the planning application, which is set out in the planning statement and the environmental report, um, have shown how those multipliers um, create the level of jobs that we've, re we've yeah. reported. OK, Mr. Mr. Smith, last question I've got for you. The aviation lights that's on, uh, proposed in the, the, I think as Jane said, the one in the here, are you aware that do the, any of the existing turbines in the, the council area have any avi aviation lights? Um, it's a good question. I'm not aware of any turbines in the Stirling area that have aviation lights. I think the closest um, comparable lights that you've probably got in, in the area that you might be familiar with are the Black Hill transmitters in North Lanarkshire. But what I would say is that there is... Uh, um, the, the officer in her report has um, stated that the lights will operate at 2000 Candela. In fact, um, for most of the time when visibility is, is better than five kilometres, the, the lights will operate at 200 Candela. That's 10% of the normal capacity. Um, so they will generally be barely visible. And of course, as the um, visibility gets worse and the lights need to ramp up to their operating capacity of 2000 Candela, of course, they'll be operating in clouds. So that, again, they'll be barely visible. We really don't see the lights in this area, um, particularly in the direction of view towards that orange glow that the officer highlighted um, uh, okay. behind the, 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 the Fintry Hills as being a particular concern with this application. OK, thanks for that. Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, can I ask the, um, Mr Smith, the applicant, um, three questions. They're kind of related, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give them all in one, in one go. Can you tell us roughly how, what percentage of time these wind turbines will operate at maximum capacity? What percentage um, 
And what, what's the most likely output that you'll get most commonly from from the um, from the combined word wind turbines? I what is what is what do you expect to get on average the most frequent output from these turbines? And then tying all that together, can you tell us um, on average what the um, the cost of generation will be? Um, by, in, in terms of the last question, the cost of generation, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Could you expand that a little? Um, we're looking at the, um, obviously, in basically it's all capital cost. And just, you know, take take the capital cost and, and uh, divide that okay. by the amount of power you expect to sell in a year. I'm not sure that's a metric that I'm familiar with, but I can certainly deal with the first two points. And while I'm doing that, I'll consider the I'll consider the last point. So turbines very rarely operate at maximum capacity, um, but they're very rarely off as well. So generally speaking, they will be producing electricity, of course, at variable rates depending on the wind speed um, for about 85 to 90 percent of the time um, this is a particularly windy site it has an excellent wind resource um, and we expect the turbines to perform very well here in terms of output um, that has been calculated and as your officer pointed out um, the, the the output is um, fairly significantly greater than that which we predicted for the um, Creighton and Spittle Hill wind farm. I'm just trying to get the, the actual figures, if you bear with me one second. Yeah, so um, the Creighton and Spittle Hill wind farm, which is consent, the expert consent, ha has the ability to power approximately um, 13,000 houses um, per annum. The, the Shellac proposal with two fewer turbines has the potential to produce enough electricity for about 23,000 houses, so significantly more energy produced over um, over the year. Um, in terms of the 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 the, the cost, um, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I really fully understand the question. I'm afraid to say, so I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to give you a, a, a reasonable answer to that. Well, I mean, we know what, what electricity costs us to buy. You know, depending on how what sort of tariffs between ten and twenty a kilowatt hour. I'm just curious to know um, <laughs> how much you'll be selling it, how much it will cost you to to generate it. So it's a fairly okay. Well, as I said in the presentation, the, the, the overall investment here is about £30 million, just less than £30 million. About 50% of that is probably on turbines. But of course, um, there, the cost per kilowatt hour, if you like, of, a, of an onshore wind farm is the lowest cost except perhaps for solar in the south of England um, for generating electricity um, in the UK just now. Can you give us a number? I mean, cause the thing I I'm trying to get my head around is is how, how much power you'll actually be selling, because as I say, the, um, the wind speeds vary. Oh. And actually, just on a raising point, what strikes me slightly odd on this application is that you seem to be Placing the turbines in the lee of a, of a hill, I would have thought you would place it on the windward side. I'm just wondering if that's the optimal place to do it, or there are some other considerations of of, of well, uh, a factor in that. Yeah, I mean, if if the planning system didn't operate the way it did, then we would have the turbines at the top of the hill because that's that is the, the the most efficient and useful place to to place the wind farms. But of course, we need to balance out all the issues as you need to do when you take your decision on the application. So what, we, what we've done is we found the best compromise between the, the landscape and visual effects and the energy production from the wind farm. Now we have a met mast on the site um, and the effect of the valley that we're in is to funnel the wind. And that means that despite being perhaps on the wrong side of a hill, 
um, we're getting a very good wind resource. Um, so we're very confident that the, the wind farm, based on the, the measured wind speeds that we have um, from that met mass, um, will be highly productive. So, uh, um, excuse me, Chair, but I'm just trying to get the answer. How much power will you be selling on average a year? Uh, um, I, from memory, I think we will be producing 72 gigawatt hours of electricity every year. Thank you. OK, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Chair. I've got a question to um, uh, Mr Smith and also one to, to our officers, perhaps roads officers. Uh, I'll, I'll direct that one first, if I may. Um, could I ask what, what difference there is in the, um, the, the road layout, et cetera, the safety aspects from the previous application? Um, Jane hinted there, there, there was um, a, an alternative route at one time. Uh, I would just like to absolutely ensure that whatever we put, put in is, is safe for future, because I, I'm not particularly keen when I look at the junction layout of the A811. Could I perhaps that first point raised? OK, who from Board of the Roads wants to get that? Hi, Chair. It's uh, Neil Perry, Senior Development okay. Control Officer. Um, certainly my discussions with the, the, the developer um, regarding this proposal uh, initially was looking to take uh, the turbine components up through uh, Fintry, uh, sorry, Kippen Village. That was the initial discussions I had. Um, I suspect that the, the length of the turbines has uh, resulted in that not being a feasible option. So the, the alternative is to to um, bring forward the proposals that have been that Jane shared earlier. Um, with regards to the, the junction upgrades um, on the, the A to 11, um, I agree it's, 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 it's generally not something that we would kind of favour, but given the, obviously the size of the vehicles and the turbine components, um, I think there's uh, 46 um, abnormal load deliveries associated, associated with the, the application. Um, so the, the junction itself, the widened junction, eh, sorry, the new junction opposite the Arnprior turn off would be would only be used kind of sparingly over the course of the of the development, and we would we would seek for that that junction to be closed off um, uh, temporarily when when not in use. Um, we've also requested a road safety audit um, subject to approval just to just to ensure that there's an independent review there um, uh, just to. To, to fully understand what the, the consequences of any new junction are and, and to ensure that they're fully mitigated. OK, does that answer your question, Councillor Thompson? It, it, it does. Uh, it, I, I take it the 46 journeys will, will be managed. They'll, they'll, uh, so in addition to the, the changes to the road layout, there will be uh, perhaps traffic lights or whatever to manage those journeys. And the, I, I'm pleased that the road is going to get closed off because I think it would have created more problems in the future had it been, been maintained as, 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 as that. Uh, Mr Smith, a couple of points. Uh, uh, Councillor Davis has touched upon it, but there has been a challenge to the generating capacity from objectors and uh, it, it must surely depend on um, wind, etc. Uh, so that, that's the first point. Could you answer the, 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 the aspect? And the other one that I'd like a bit more clarity on is the payback. I, I've i certainly been involved in a few of these and a year and a half uh, seems very low. Now, uh, I've, I've kind of listed for myself the, the elements that, that make up the, the carbon footprint. You've got the manufacturer, you've got the transport, you've got the erection, you've got the maintenance, you've got the removal and you've got renovation. Um, I, I presume that all of these make up the, the your calculation of the carbon footprint. Yeah, so in terms of a uh, carbon footprint, um, we are required to use a calculator, which I think has been referred to, which was produced by SEPA. Um, so SEPA own that calculator and they amend it and change it as required depending on the, the, the nature of um, the, the progress of different developments. Um, so it does change over time. Um, and it's standard across um, all wind farm 
developments um, and uh, therefore consistent um, and can be compared with, with, with other developments. Um, the reason we've got a relatively low um, carbon payback, oh, I should say that calculator does take into account all the things that you've listed, transportation, manufacture, construction, um, the, the, the turbine erection, um, uh, in forested environments, it'll take account of woodland removal, it also takes account of peatland loss. Um, so all of the sort of negative side of the, the, the carbon equation, if you like, is, is taken account of in that um, calculator, which, as I said, is prepared by CEPA and therefore standardised. Um, the reason we've got a relatively low carbon payback um, goes back to your first point. Um, it is a windy site. Our Met Mast is telling us that, and the turbines that we're deploying there um, will make the best use of that wind resource. So we have a high capacity factor, we have um, a good productive wind farm um, should the committee choose to, to consent the site. And the second part is um, a lot of the, the a lot of what we're doing on site um, uses existing roads so that we're upgrading tracks. We're not needing to build significant lengths of new track, which is, is different to a lot of wind farms. And also there's not despite what some of the objectors said earlier, there's not significant peak deposits on the site. About 86% of the probes that we did, and I think we did in the region of 2,000 peak probes across the site, um, showed that soils um, were not peaty. And, and a, peat, a, a peaty soil is a soil that contains peat or peat forming uh, mosses uh, where the the depth is is greater than half a meter. So we've deliberately designed the development around avoiding those deeper areas of peat on site to avoid um, disturbing the peat. And in addition, we're also proposing a habitat management plan which will look to restore um, some of the degraded areas of site because it's quite a heavily grazed um, uh, uh, landscape. Okay. Councillor Thompson, do you have any other questions? No. Okay, Councillor McGill. Yep, thanks, Chair. Uh, I just wondered, um, first, when I read this, I was quite shocked at the size of the proposed turbines, and I really just wondered why, um, why that was. Um, I also wanted to know how closely this site is located to the previous um, the, or the existing wind farms and why the existing access road to these the existing wind farms couldn't be utilised because it, and when you see the, the, the photographs that um, the officer put up of the, the proposed track going through fields um, and the, the destruction that's going to cost um, I just wondered why the previous um, access track couldn't be used. Um, I also wondered where the turbines are, are built. Are they in this country or are they abroad? Um, and as uh, Councillor Thompson has just say, um, asked, I was interested to know if that was added into the carbon footprint of this development. And I also wondered, um, given the rise in electricity prices, why um, or it, it, will Stirling residents benefit from lower electricity prices during the lifetime of this uh, planned proposal? Mr Smith, I think these questions are primarily for you. Yeah, but, um, yeah. so firstly, we're considering taller turbines um, for this project. Um, because we wish to try, uh, as encouraged by Scottish uh, government policy to generate, uh, get the best out of the, the site, get the best out of the wind resource on the site and generate as much clean green electricity as we possibly can. Now, part of the design of the project was to pull the turbines slightly further back from the escarpment than the, the original consented project. So recognising they're taller, we pulled them back and that we feel mitigates um, some of the landscape and visual effects which, which have been discussed. 
In terms of access, the, the original consented project took access from the south uh, through the Caron Valley. That road is not capable of accommodating um, the, the size of blades that we wish to take to the site. So that's why we looked for an alternative. Um, we consented the, the northern access route uh, up the spout of Balaclean, and then we've incorporated it with further details into the application for Shella. We were very careful about the design of that access route that we should avoid um, the trees on the Sintry Arn Prior Road. Um, and I think we've been successful in, in avoiding any disturbance to, to those, those trees. So that, that was a carefully considered um, issue. Um, in terms of um, the, the carbon footprint, I think I've answered that. The, 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 um, the, the carbon calculator takes into account um, the manufacture and transportation of turbines. The turbines are built abroad. Um, there's not sufficient market in the UK at this point in time for a manufacturing facility. It's not, not strictly true. There is, there's a manufacturing facility in the hull, but those turbines are, are destined for the offshore market. Um, but the types of turbines that we would deploy on this site are, are, are built abroad. But all of, all of those costs, if you like, those carbon costs of transport and all the rest of it are taken into account in, 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 in considering the carbon calculator. And in terms of electricity prices, well, electricity prices generally are pegged against the gas price. And the gas price is the thing that's driving the rise in, 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 in the exponential rise in electricity costs at this point in time. It's only by deploying onshore winds, which is the cheapest cost of electricity production, certainly in Scotland, that we mitigate the effect of those gas price rises um, and create the circumstance where, I'm not going to say wind farms are going to reduce the electricity price because it's always going to peg against the gas price, but we can mitigate it and, and pull it back down from where gas is going. Um, and make electricity as affordable as we possibly can in this country. Okay, Councillor Davis. Yes, thanks, Chair. Just to come back to uh, to Mr. Smith on the comments about the location. I'm just curious to know how much more power you could have generated if you put the wind turbines on top of the hills and the optimum position, obviously. The negative effect on the landscape. I'm just wondering how much you're giving up in terms of power generation for that. <clears throat> and secondly, um, apologies if these calculations are wrong, but it looks to me as if you're going to be generating something like 15 million pounds a year revenue from these turbines. Is it not worth considering compensating the um, communities that Councillor Earl represented in his presentation for their loss of visual amenity and uh, Offering the same um, compensation to Port of Monteith and the other communities, Thornhill. Councillor, so Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, before you answer that, I'm going to ask Chris Cox to come in here because I think Councillor okay. McGill was kind of making the point as well about you know community benefit for Stirling residents and, here, and and I know we've got to be very careful now. You know, decisions are taken against community benefit, but Chris, can you comment a wee bit on that because I, I, we can't be led around the road of communities yeah. benefit and so that we can give decisions you know okay th yes thank you chair um yes there's been quite a wide-ranging discussion this morning on this this proposal and i'm sure members are interested in the responses that have been given but just for clarity there's a few areas there that are just not material to your consideration as relevant planning matters so if we can just cover those off um so the cost of the development uh, electricity prices Carbon calculator isn't yet a material planning consideration, but it's in draft MPF4 and, and soon will be, but um, it's not yet. Alternative locations for the development is not um, relevant. And then lastly, um, your question around about community benefits and compensation. That's it. Uh, very separate from the planning system and um, you're legally required to ensure that that doesn't come into your consideration. That's solely between the applicant and the communities, um, but it, it's, it's certainly not something that you can consider in your planning considerations on the merits of the proposals. Thanks. 
Councillor Davis, I, that's you know that's part of the the, the planning training. And and, and I, I, listen, I share your frustration, and I, I would like answers to that. But we've got to detach ourselves from it. A uh, councillor Houston. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question for for officers. It was raised by one of the objectors that in our supplementary uh, guidance, paragraph five thirteen. Uh, refers to the uh, no capacity for very large turbines over 110 metres. And although some subsequently uh, have been approved 125 metres, etc., could I just have an explanation about why uh, this application, which is substantially in excess of the supplementary guidance uh, figure, uh, is being recommended? Thank you. Yes. Jane, do you want to get that? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the the figure that you referred to in Supplementary Guidance 515 was a constraint to do with landscape scale. And there are a number of different constraints listed within the Supplementary Guidance, some of which developments will meet and some that they won't. So um, it, this is an area of uh, search in terms of uh, wind farm developments. Um, and in terms of the location within the, the area, um, was acceptable. So, you know, as I've set out in my report, I think it's uh, paragraph 2.106, there are aspects of this development. So it says, um, consequently, the current proposal does not comply with the landscape and visual guidance set out in the supplementary guidance uh, for the same reasons previously mentioned. So I am highlighting within my report that there are aspects um, within policy and supplementary guidance that this proposal does not comply with. But as with every planning application, there has to be a balance of these. And um, when considering wind farm developments, there's a number of criteria that need to be looked at. So um, if I could just refer back to policy 12.1, there's the contribution to renewable energy generation targets and the effect on greenhouse ga gas emissions. There's landscape and visual impacts, and that was the bit within the supplementary guidance that you highlighted to do with scale that this proposal didn't meet. There's also consideration of the effects on natural heritage, on the historic on environment, on aviation, on residential and community amenity, net economic impact. So, I, I, I mean, there, there are there 13 aspects within the policy that need to be considered. And as with all proposals, a proposal may meet some of them and may not meet others. And it's coming to a balance. Now, within this particular proposal, there's also balancing that with the fact that there is a, an extant permission for a wind farm on this site of seven turbines. And this proposal is is on that site for five turbines, albeit that they are um, greater scale. So, um, you know, there's, there's a balance to be struck. So I've highlighted in the report, yes, there are aspects of the policy that this proposal doesn't meet, but that has to be balanced. Okay, thanks for that, Jane. I don't see any further hands up. So before we come to the decision, from the panel, I'm going to offer the, the applicant uh, agent, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, you had a 45 seconds on use from your presentation and also a minute over time for the objectors. So you have a couple of minutes if you want it. Do you, do you want to use that now to give us any final information or kind of sum it up from your point of view? Thank you. Um, yes, I would take that opportunity. I'll probably be a lot briefer than the two minutes that you're offering me. Okay. Shall I pro progress? Yeah, yes, just proceed. Yeah. So, in, in summing up, all I would say is um, a, a lot of what um, was addressed to the panel by others looked backwards. Um, it looked at the previous application, it looked at the Stirling Council's attitude to that application at that point in time. Policy has moved on, um, wind turbine technology has moved on. Um, and emerging policy from the Scottish Government is very clear and unambiguous. We must meet legally binding climate change targets. And this is a development that can contribute significantly to those targets. And in further summing up, all I would say is you have before you a wind farm application, which fairly unusually has no objection from SNH, no objection from Loch Lomond and the Tossets National Park, 
no objection oh, from God. FIFA. Um, there is no evidence to so show that wind farms impact on tourism. And there was a report recently um, which uh, studied 44 wind farms across Scotland, which drew no uh, uh, no conclusions that there was any impact on 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 on, uh, on tourism businesses. So I would urge councillors to to, to to look forward um, and consider the balance of issues that Jane highlighted in her in her last uh, in her last um, point to to committee. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, now the move to the decision by the panel. The recommendations contained, officer recommendations contained on page one, which is to approve application subject to conditions set in appendix one, and obviously to, to grant delegated authority for the changing of conditions two and four to two, I think it was. So anyone that would move, move the recommendation? I'm happy to move the recommendation to approve. Okay, anyone want to second that? Okay, Councillor Thompson, is there anyone otherwise minded? No. So there's, there's no amendments to refuse. Councillor McGill, do you have your hand up? No. Okay, so if there's no amendments, the application is approved as per the recommendations and the changes. So we're, we're going now going to have a five minute recess to allow the contributors to leave and to bring in the new ones for the next application. John Paul Thank Wilkinson you. is now exiting.
Yes, I will do. Thanks. If I can just confirm the members present again. Councillor Davies. Yes, present. Councillor Farmer. Present. Councillor Houston. I'm here. Councillor McPherson. Here. Councillor McGill. I'm here. And Councillor Thompson. Yep, present. Lovely. That's everyone. Thanks, Chair. OK, thanks for that, David. And we're on to item four on the agenda, which is the erection of 89 houses in principle at the former Calern Hospital site in Calern. This one, again, is a hearing, and I'll outline the, the process of the hearing in the ring order. It's an introduction of the report by the planning officer, presentation by the applicants, which is limited to five minutes, presentation by supporters, five minutes presentation by the objectors of five minutes and there is no local member speaking on behalf or against this one so i'm going to hand over to mike mulgrew who's doing this application mike thank you chair i'll just start sharing my screen and can i just ask can panel confirm that they can see that presentation on the screen Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, members will recall that at the meeting of the Planning and Regulation Panel on the 9th of November 2021, this application was deferred for a hearing. Due to a subsequent change in panel membership, this presentation is being rerun afresh prior to the hearing. On the 6th of October 2020, panel approved application 20-00098-FUL, subject to conditions and satisfactory conclusion of a Section 75 legal agreement. That application was for the erection of 89 dwelling houses within principal erection of five number class four and class one buildings, care home facility, and also the demolition of the remaining buildings and remediation of the site with associated infrastructure, open space, landscaping, drainage and tree works. This application has been returned to panel for decision as the developers have requested a change to the previously approved conditions. As set out in the report, the site is envisaged to be developed in two phases, with the larger site one outlined here in solid red, um, coming forward in detail um, for residential development, and site two outlined here in dash red line, coming forward in detail at a later date. There is no change sought to this phasing, however, the decision taken by panel included conditions that required the entire site to be remediated prior to development on any part of the site. The applicants are now seeking to alter these conditions to allow each subsite to be remediated independently of each other. Members will see that site two here is the smaller of the sites and with fewer buildings. Members will also note from the report that this site is less contaminated and requires less remediation than the larger site one. There is no change to the site layout. However, as set out in the report, additional details of landscaping and boundary treatments between site one and site two in this area here have been requested. Members will also note that there have been consequential changes to other conditions as a result to ensure that previously recommended conditions can be fulfilled. I've included this photograph for context to show the current view of site two on approach from the A81 traveling northbound. This concludes my presentation. As per the report, my recommendation is to approve subject to conditions and conclusion of the section 75 legal agreement. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Mike. The next section of the hearing is a presentation by the applicants, and we've got Andrew Woodrow, but also in, in, in presence, we've also got, I think it's uh, Mr Graham McNeil and Mike Bradley for more technical questions. So, Mr Woodrow, if you limit your presentation to five minutes, please, and after four minutes, okay. I'll ask you to sum up. No problem. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Andrew Woodrow of Barton Wilmore, acting as agent on behalf of Calla Homes. I'm joined today by Graham McNeil, Land and Development Director from Calla, and Mike Bradley, Managing Director of JPB Consulting Engineers. I'll be delivering a brief presentation whilst Graham and Mike are available, along with myself, to address any queries that you may have afterwards. The reason for this application return to committee is because CALA are seeking to vary a small number of conditions relating to their development. We know that the officers have recommended that the members approve the application with these proposed varied conditions. Members requested this hearing at the last panel in order to gain further information on the reasoning for the change in conditions, 
Hopefully we can assist you today in understanding the position more fully, allowing you to make a decision on the varied conditions. To begin, it's important to note that CALA are acquiring the majority of the site, but not the whole site. Accordingly, CALA can only assume rights over the land that they are acquiring. By extension, CALA will not have access rights over a part of the site, since there is a parcel that the current landowner will retain. For consistency, we'll refer to this site as the future commercial site. So why is CALA seeking to vary the wording of conditions? The reality is that the conditions, as approved previously, would prevent CALA from developing the housing site, since the current wording of the conditions would require CALA to complete and evidence demolition and remediation across the whole extent of the site prior to any construction works commencing. With access over the future commercial site unavailable, it would be impossible for CALA to complete and evidence whole site demolition and remediation, and therefore impossible for CALA to satisfy those conditions. This is why CALA need to vary the conditions. So what would the change in conditions mean in practice? If the proposed amended conditions were approved, CALA would remediate and develop the land they are acquiring, whilst the future commercial site would remain in its current condition until such time as that site is brought forward for development. For the avoidance of doubt, CALA do not save any cost by not remediating the future commercial site. It has always been the case that the cost of remediation on that site would be met by the owner. And since CALA isn't the owner of that land, they will not incur any cost in this regard. It's, on, it's also important to state that the cost associated with the future commercial site represents a relatively small sum of money in the context of the overall remediation costs attributable to the larger CALA site. This is because the land that CALA is seeking to acquire and develop is the largest and most contaminated part of the site, meaning that the housing site will attract the vast majority of demolition and remedi remediation costs. Turning to the development plan briefly, the varied conditions will comply with the Stirling Council LDP since at no point does the LDP require that the remediation of the whole site is to take place all at once. Simply put, the varied conditions allow for the remediation of the entire site, but in a phased manner. Expert opinion has identified that this approach is achievable, appropriate, practical, and most importantly, safe. To further reassure you, CALA and the Council independently tasked accredited consultants to consider the impacts and risks arising as a result of this phased approach to demolition and remediation. The consultants, independent of each other, came to the same conclusion that the housing site can be developed safely with the new homes occupied and the adjacent future commercial site left in its current condition. This position is supported by all specialists, CALA and Stirling Council officers, including environmental health, hence the recommendation for approval. You have, a, you, have a, you have a minute left, Mr Woodrow. Okay. No problem. For the avoidance of any doubt, when the future commercial site is developed, this site too will require to be fully remediated prior to any construction works taking place. We would hope that with the new housing, the attractiveness of the future commercial site would improve significantly, making this site's delivery even more likely. At the heart of CALA's ambition is giving a new lease of life to a site that has lain derelict for decades. There's an opportunity now for much needed new housing to transform the landscape and support the delivery of a future commercial site. CALA and indeed the Community Council want to seize this opportunity. This development, however, will be put in serious doubt unless the members approve the varied, varied conditions. And this is why member support today will represent a key milestone in terms of securing this site's delivery. And that uh, brings my presentation to a close. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Woodrow. You used it five minutes, so we've done this spot on timing. And move to the next section of the hearing, which is a presentation by supporters. And we've got Mr. Tomey from Killer and Community Council. Mr. Tomey, again, uh, you've got five minutes, and I'll ask you to sum up after four if you want well, to start the presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it very short. Um, the Community yeah. Council understands the reason for the amendment to the original conditions. And we do acknowledge that the developer cannot unilaterally decontaminate the whole site. The Community Council's position has always been, and still is, 
That has included the LBP. We would wish the entire site to be decontaminated, which, after all, was the sole reason for the development. We had hoped that this could be undertaken in one contract rather than a phased manner. Following developments, however, it appears this scenario is unlikely to transpire, and we are faced with the prospect of accepting part remediation of the project or the project failing altogether, leaving the whole site in its contaminated state. We note the part of the site which could be decontaminated represents by far the majority of the site, comprising over 70%, and realise this is preferable to the worst-case scenario of the proposal failing through, falling through completely. We are also aware there is no guarantee of a second phase ever coming to fruition. On the basis that at least the majority of the site would be cleared and the remainder provides a lower risk to persons on the site or the local community, Calern Community Council supports the change in conditions to allow the development of the site in a phased manner. We would also request the support of Stirling Council in applying such levels and conditions as it can to have the remainder of the site decontaminated at some early stage. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Tomit. Uh, we have the next section of the hearing, which is a presentation by objectors, and we have uh, Mr. David Young here. Mr. Young, again, if you limit your presentation to five minutes, and I'll ask you to sum up after four minutes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Callis shouldn't, in my opinion, be permitted to decontaminate only one part of the site, build houses thereon, and leave the second part to be remediated at some unknown point in the future. That proposal would go against the LDP and legislation. Section 32A, subsection 2 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 97 provides that if the planning authority consider the variation to be such that there is a substantial change in the description of the development for which planning permission is sought, they are not to agree to the variation. The Scottish courts have determined in 1998, in a case against Scottish Borders Council, that substantial change is a qualitative exercise. That is to say, you're getting less than originally proposed. So Cal undertook a pack in February 2020 where Cal stated under the heading proposals at section 3.3 they would undertake full remediation of the site, including the site the planning permission and principle was sought. They stated under table 1 at section 6.8 that it was recognised in LDP that 70 units would create enough revenue to facilitate the remediation of the site. However, it was now clear that in commercial terms, 86 units would be necessary to allow full remediation of that site, including the proposed commercial site, at 2.2 hectares, the commercial site is 20% of the overall 11 hectares. And under section 8.2 of the pack, Cala stated, and I quote, most importantly, the proposed development seeks approval for the demolition of existing buildings on site and the full site-wide remediation. They repeated those statements in the planning statement. In particular, in the planning statement, they stated under section 2.6, the key components of the proposed development are as follows. Demolition of remaining former hospital buildings full remediation of the sites from contamination in consultation with Surrey Council and SEPA. During the meeting on 9th of November 21, Ms Cox confirmed in response to a question by Councillor Gibson that it was her view that bringing this application before panel in this manner was appropriate. Ms Cox stated, No, it's a very important procedural matter and we've consulted with legal services on this. Mark Easton's in line and I think I'll probably refer it on to Mark. What I would say, it's really critical in our consideration on this the fact that the applicants themselves are not changing the proposals. The proposal remains a proposal without consultation on which everybody was able to make representations. What is changing is the conditions which the officers brought forward to panel. Hmm. So that's, it may be subtle, but that was something that nobody had any prior sight of as they don't until the report comes to panel. It's not as if the applicant have themselves changed the proposal in front of the panel. But as you will note, that is simply not the case. My statement today might be considered a, bit a new matter that I had not addressed in my original objections, which I submitted to Stirling Council on the 6th of July 20. I did not, of course, know about the proposal to split the site into two phases at a time, as it was not until 20th of October 21 that I became so aware. I would object to any suggestion I cannot raise a new matter at the hearing on this application rather than be confined to my written objections as the planning toolbox states, when I wasn't even aware of this proposal. And it was confirmed to me that Miss Cox on the 7th of December 20, that the procedures in the toolbox have not been formally approved by Council. So if the planning toolbox procedures are merely internal procedures of the planning department that have not even been approved by Stirling Council, 
they cannot be legally binding on myself and others. I would, however, contend that what I've submitted to the panel is not a new matter, but is simply a statement of the law. Councillors were not made aware of the existence of Section 32A of the 97 Act at a panel meeting on the 9th of November 21. The Planning Authority, of course, has an overriding obligation to apply the law. I provided prior notification of this by email that I will raise this matter to Mr Mulgrew, Ms Cox and Mr Easton. It is not for the planning office to try and intercede in a dispute between two commercial parties. Phase two would remain in the hands of a dormant company which has shown no inclination to develop the site since they bought it and wars have disappeared over the years. Indeed, you've, Graham you've McNeil... A, a minute left, Mr Young. Yep. Indeed, Graham McNeil, land director with Cala, at the Clarence Community Council meeting on the 17th of November 21, accepted the possibility that phase two might never be remediated. It is clearly in the public interest to this site fully decontaminated and ensure the council don't unwittingly assume some liability. That would be for Cala to be held to the original planning application that was previously granted and this application for a variation on the section 32 as, is refused as constituting a substantial change in the description. If the two companies involved cannot resolve their differences, Cala would then require to submit a new planning application which would allow respondents to comment in the usual course. And that's the end of my presentation. OK, thanks for that, Mr Young. OK, move now to questions from panel members to officers and any contributors of the, today's hearing. Questions, <coughs> panel members? Councillor Davis? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Chris, um, Chris Cox, Head of Planning. <clears throat> Can you just come back on the points raised by the um, by the objector to clarify that it seems to be point of procedure. I don't, I don't not, not quite understand what's going on there. Uh, yes, thanks, Councillor Davis. I, I wasn't actually following um, some of what was being said, um, although I did follow the narrative that um, the objector gave in terms of the reason why it was appropriate for this to come uh, to panel in this way. Um, I think probably it would be better for Mike or Mark Easton to pick up on, I think the substance of the, the concern is from the, the objector is that this should be subject to a separate application and wasn't, to be honest, altogether following, but Mike, if you could chip in. Uh, yes, thanks, Chris. Um, so my understanding of the objector's comments there is, is that under Section 32A of the Planning Act, um, there's a suggestion that we have accepted something that constitutes a significant change um, to the proposal description. And where there is a significant change, legislation directs us that we should not accept that change. That is correct. However, that is not what has happened in this instance. Um, the subject of the change is a change to the conditions. It's not a change to the application proposal or the description or the extent of works to be carried out. It's simply a change to the phasing, which in any event, Stone Council can control by condition. Um, the conditions were put forward originally as intended to cover the entire site, but it is also competent within our legislation to consider that the um, conditions are applied at certain points in time. The overriding concern for conditions is uh, set out in um, Circular uh, 3 slash 2012, whereby conditions have to be reasonable and appropriate. Um, this change that has been sought meets that request and doesn't contravene um, what is set out in Section 32A of the Planning Act. OK, Councillor Davis, you want to come back in that? Um, yeah, so in that case, can I ask Mr Woodrow, um, was, it, was, it, was it in, what's changed since the original application that uh, <clears throat> they no longer have access to the um, the second, the, the smaller part of the site and they now wish to change it? I mean, is, is it correct then, as the objector says, that this is a civil dispute uh, aiming to be resolved through the planning panel? Am I correct in that assumption? Uh, thank you, Councillor Davies. Uh, Chair, uh, with your permission, I'd probably bring in uh, Graham McNeil on this one, who's uh, from Cala, in terms of that arrangement. OK. Hi, um, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Chair. And um, in relation to the query from Councillor Davis, um, the negotiation um, originally took place um, back in 2018. Um, we all have aspirations that, that change through time. Um, there was a, a recognition um, that the expectation was that the whole site would be remediated 
um, um, prior to any development um, taking place. That would require uh, CALA and the landowner um, to um, organise and facilitate um, what we refer to as a, a licence to occupy. Um, CALA have been relentless in, in a request to occupy um, the Phase 2 land in order to carry out um, any necessary works. Um, having made no progress um, in that regard, and looking at every single possible uh, permutation to, to safeguard delivery of the project, we um, reflected on a phased remediation approach, i.e. complete what is within our control to complete. Um, and of course, uh, we do that um, against the backdrop of um, health and safety um, and environmental considerations. Um, hence um, the, the role that JPB have played um, along the way. Um, it's also worth highlighting that the Council themselves have actually undertaken a peer review independent of CALA and their consultants to ascertain whether a phased approach is compatible with health and safety and environmental considerations and CALA are satisfied that our site operatives, future residents, etc. Um, um, will not be uh, compromised in any way, shape or form should a, a remediation uh, phase, should a phased approach to remediation take place. Um, it is regrettable that the whole site cannot be remediated all at once, but CALA have to be pragmatic and have to be practical. Um, and as Andrew's uh, presentation had actually touched on earlier as well, we are of the, 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 the sincere view that phase two, the smaller site, the less contaminated site, will ultimately be developed. But that's an opinion and that is based on experience. The general view is that um, a, a well-connected, um, high-quality residential site on 80% of the site will actually be quite catalytic and will ultimately deliver vis-a-vis uh, -vis the overall vision for the site. Okay. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's to, to Mr Woodrow and, and um, Calla. Um, uh, uh, as a councillor, I've been involved with the iterations of the local development plan and Glen Hospital comes up uh, often. And we, we took the view, uh, ultimately, that what we wanted to do was develop the site for commercial activities, but with a recognition that we needed an enabler to decontaminate, which was the housing. Now we've got an application where phase two, which is the bit we really wanted back in the day, is not going to happen as part of the overall development. And we're relying on the landowner to decontaminate and to make that site available. And we get the houses, but we don't necessarily. And, and, and I accept the fact, uh, Mr Woodrow, that you've no control over phase two. But we did expect the whole site to be contaminated, so it was all available to uh, for development. Uh, so my question to you is, on that basis, do you now understand the, the concerns that we as councillors have? We, we have gone out of our way, if you like, to, to, to make the site available for development, but we're not getting the development that we expected through the local development plan. And you, you, you say the landowner... Um, isn't allowing you onto site two, but you have control. You don't have to buy site one without some control over site two. C could I have your views on that? Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Um, I, again, this um, comes down to probably a, a situation with, between the two landowners in, in terms of the development plan, though, and your approach there. Certainly, this phased approach, whilst I see your concerns. This phased approach uh, still allows for the full uh, decontamination um, of the sites. It's just in a phased manner. Um, when it comes down to the control of the two portions of land, again, sorry, Graham, um, if, if, if I can pass to yourself on that matter. Yeah, um, I think it's important to, to point out that um, the, the enabling aspect of the development will actually take place on the majority of the site. And as a result, the majority of the site, i.e. those parts of the site that actually have the most buildings for demolition and are in need of urgent remediation and decontamination, will actually be attended to. I, I, I would ask that we do not lose sight of the fact that phase two is significantly less contaminated, has one building far removed from the residential development, and, and in reality, in cost terms, will actually be um, effectively repurposed for a relatively minimal cost. It is not true or accurate.
Sorry, I don't know if you got cut off there, the Mr. McNeil. So, Councillor Thompson, you want to come back in that? I would like to hear what uh, Mr McNeill's got to say, uh, 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 Councillor McPherson. Um, I, I, I haven't made up my mind whether the, the landowner um, is the problem or Cala are the problem. And that's something we will never understand. But I, I want to ensure that whatever we do, we give the best possible opportunity for phase two to go ahead. And if, if decontamination of the whole of the site is the best way forward, and I know I'm expressing an opinion here, not asking a question, but that, that that's what's in my head at the minute. Yeah. Could I, could I respond? Yeah, is that Mr McNeil, yeah? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yep. Um, okay. Apologies, apologies. Um, I, I'm trying to kind of understand the, 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 the question um, from Councillor Thompson, okay, so I, I was kind of halfway through um, last time. There was never any guarantee that any part of any site will be developed with the benefit of a consent. What we can say is that CALA represents, I, I imagine, the, 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 the best answer and, and the greatest potential for the smaller phase two to be developed. The enabling housing and development will certainly enhance the prospects of site two coming forward. The last point I would make is even if site two was to be contaminated, uh, decontaminated um, as, a, as a single phase of remediation, there is still no guarantee that the, the, the phase two future commercial site would come forward. Um, everyone obviously is hopeful that that is exactly how the, the situation will play out. But I think it's important to distinguish between what is likely to happen as a result of enabling development versus what as a, as a cast iron guarantee will happen. I think um, Cala represents the best um, chance for um, phase two um, to um, uh, deliver um, uh, deliver in the future. Okay, could, could I ask Mike or maybe Chris or Mark Easton here, the, the, I'm looking at the, the, the name of this, this application, the title of it, the housing elements in principle, right, but the actual Part of the applications got as, as a full application. I just want to clarify: is this, this is a, in principle application? Part of it's a full application, but obviously the recommendations, which are contained in page forty-nine, if the panel was to go with this, was to for the conclusion of a section seventy-five legal agreement. And Mr. I think Mr. Young made the point here. You know that is it possible for the panel to grant consent? And as part of any section 75 or any condition, additional condition, to ensure that the commercial element of this is contaminated by way of a bond or anything, you know, I, I, probably not, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. I don't know if Mike wants to take that or Chris or Mark. Uh, yes, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So just to... Um clarify your first point there. Um, this is essentially a hybrid application. So there are two parts to it. Um, the full detailed part of it is the housing and the in principle part is basically the site too, which is the commercial element. So um, you'll see from the, the, the proposed approved plans um, that there is no detail of the non-residential components of the site. So even in the event if panel were to grant um, the application today with um, the amended conditions or indeed the existing conditions, it would still require the submission of a further application to agree the detail of those commercial sites. So I hope that addresses the first point. Um, the second point relating to the bond, um, a bond is usually necessary for when we need to restore the land to its, its original condition. So for example, um, there is an upcoming item in the agenda where we are proposing that a bond will be done just to ensure that should works not happen that we can restore the land to its original condition because of result of work to that land in this instance um, we would be requiring cala to remove or sorry requiring by condition the landowner um, and whoever takes on the consent to re remediate that land in full so therefore that cost is expected to be made, uh, to be met by the developer and um, prior um, to any construction, should they not do that, we would be able to take plan and enforcement action that there's been a breach of condition. So in that in that respect, there wouldn't be any legal need 
for a bond. In relation to the section 75, could, is there any possibility of us adding an additional condition or part of the section 75 agreement to do anything that we, you know, would either can ensure the site or the commercial site is can decontaminated? Is there anything we could put in there? I think uh, 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 I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, no, Mike. I'm not. So, sorry, I'm, sorry, is that Mark Easton? Yeah. It is Mark, sorry, yes. Um, yeah. it, it was just to, to, to confirm that um, anything that goes into a Section 75 agreement, um, they're, they're actually referred to as planning obligations. So there must be a, a reason um, in planning terms for that to go in. And it, as Mike has highlighted, um, regarding the uh, restoration of, of the site, you would ordinarily seek a, a bonding requirement um, if we are the lands to be reinstated to its original use following um, development. In terms of asking for anything, that uh, the, the, the subject matter that, that you're looking to put into the Section 75 agreement around about making sure something is, is remediated um, is something that relates primarily to the use of the land and could be adequately controlled by conditions. So on that basis, you wouldn't put it into a Section 75 agreement uh, because it would be inconsistent with this, um, the planning circular around about what goes into uh, into these documents. Okay, yeah, I, I, I kind of suspect that the answer. It just really concerns me here that the council ultimately could be left exposed here going forward in the future. And, and the Blainfield print works are still fresh in my mind, and they obviously want to get government funding and council. So, you know, it's just really frustrating. There's nothing we can do in planning terms that we guarantee. As Councillor Thompson said, you know, this is not, like, like him, I've been through the various iterations of the LDP, and this was always a prerequisite to get the full site decontaminated. But there you go. We are there, we are there. Councillor Davis. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Can I just go back to, to Mr. McNeil then? <clears throat> was it your understanding in, for the initial application that you would be granted a license to occupy phase two for the purposes of decontamination? <clears throat> and if something happens subsequently, <clears throat> either in financial terms or other terms, that is stopping that? Um, it would not. Uh, so, uh, so it's, it's Graham McNeil from Cala. Apologies, uh, Chair. Um, it would be entirely normal and uh, normal practice um, for, uh, for example, a, a license um, to uh, be forthcoming in, in situations such as this. And it would not uh, be uncommon for a license to sit outside of the, the principal contract exchange between developer and landowner. Um, in this particular case, uh, something that we feel should have been a, a formality hasn't taken place. Um, and um, but I don't think it would be appropriate to, to second guess the reasons why um, this has been more difficult for the, the current landowner to um, facilitate. Um, I wouldn't want to, to second guess that, and that wouldn't be fair. Um, I, I do want to make um, the uh, uh, to reinforce the point again, though. Uh, and Calla Calla thought very, very, very um, carefully about how we would actually approach. Um, this, uh, what we actually think is a, a very pragmatic measure. We are actually taking a, 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 I don't mean to be cliched, but a science-based approach. The site that we are acquiring is the most contaminated with the most buildings to demolish. We are satisfied that our development can actually sit adjacent to the, the unremediated site, principally because of the, the, the contaminated nature of the adjacent site, i.e., in our view and the view of our consultants and indeed environmental health and the council's retained consultants that, that there is absolute compatibility here uh, you know uh, uh, the, the, the principle of whole site uh, remediation i totally understand but i think it's really important to also understand that if you take a, a patchwork quilt approach that phase two is different to phase one phase one is a bigger challenge and more costly phase two is not the remediation of phase two should not be a challenge for the landowner and or the developer to overcome when that site transitions from a PPIP to a detailed planning consent. Um, it, it should not be um, uh, difficult for, for, for that challenge to be overcome. Okay. Any further questions? No. Okay. The recommendations contained in page 49, which is obviously the recommendations one, and two, does anyone want to move the recommendations? Chair, can I make a comment? 
Well, okay. Um, I'm not going to oppose this for the reasons that have been stated, but I sincerely hope that Cala and the landowner can get together and agree to remediate the whole site, if only because economy of scale surely suggests if you've got a contractor in at one part of the site, they can do the work at the other part for less cost. I, I want to do everything possible to ensure that phase two is made viable and decontamination in advance would uh, achieve that. So on that basis, I, I won't oppose the recommendation, but I hope that Cala are listening and perhaps the landowner can be made aware of, of uh, our concerns. Okay, Councillor Davis, do you want to move the recommendations on page 49? You've got your hand up. No, I'd like, just like to make a comment. Um, I know that this project was very dear to the heart of the late Graham Lambie, and he was, um, as Councillor Thompson, was very keen to uh, to get the the commercial development um, move forward. And I, I think he would be very uh, disappointed at the, the the developments that have happened. So um, I, I will not be moving support. In fact, I will be voting against the proposal. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to move the, with a heavy heart, I must say, I'm going to move the recommendations outlined in 49, because I think that Community Council has broad support, and I think we've got to respect the, right, the Community Council, the, the views of the Community Council here. As I say, has been, you know, for decades, is, and is going to provide affordable housing funding. So, you know, it's, I think it ticks the boxes for me, and we just need to trust the process. So I'm going to move recommendations. We're looking for somebody to second it. And what to second me? Chair, I'd be happy to, to second it. I, th I think, like others, I'm very disappointed that, that this uh, hasn't been solved. I, I, I think uh, for Carla to say it, it wouldn't be correct for them to second guess what the landowner is. But actually, they've been in negotiations. So one would hope that they actually know uh, what the, the reasons for the landowner not to agree to this. Because it, uh, as Councillor Thompson said, it makes absolute commercial sense, just, just the volume and scale that's, that's to be done. So one would hope that that the two parties could get together uh, and and come to some sort of agreement to remediate both sites at the same time, which must make uh, uh, just commercial sense on all sides. Um, however, I, I think, you know, listening to the community and the wish to, to see this site at least start um, to, to uh, be put back to some sort of uh, more visually appreciative uh, um, uh, stance would be would be supportive. So uh, I think on balance, I'm very happy to support the uh, the recommendations in the paper. Thank you. Okay, I've got a proposal and a second for the recommendations. Is there anyone otherwise minded? Councillor Davis, you intimated you may want to go for refusal. Yes, I'd like to. Uh, um um, vote against. Right. Well, you need to give valid planning reasons for that. Can you outline them, please? Um, the reason would be, I think this is a civil dispute that's trying to be resolved through the planning mechanism, and the planning mechanism is not designed to resolve a civil dispute. Right. Um, before I ask Chris Cox whether or not these are robust reasons, I need to check if somebody's wanting to second you. Anyone want to second Councillor Davis? No. Okay, so you don't have a second there, Councillor Davis, so I'm just going to check with the clerk here, uh, David, presumably then this application is then approved? Uh, yes, it can be. Chair Councillor Davis can ask for a dissent to be noted to have him to find a seconder. Okay, yes, Councillor. I'll record my dissent on that. Okay, so application is approved as per the recommendations. And again, we're going to have, I just want to check with the clerk, do we need a, a five minute, re, it's a five minute recess sufficient now, or but understand the others are about two and a half hours, but we're, so what's the position here with regard to the, are panel members happy with five minutes or 10 minutes, what, what the panel members want? Five minutes, fine. Yeah, five minutes, just get the business yeah. taken care of, yeah. Okay, so we'll reconvene in five minutes, that's 12.26, about 12.31 then. Thank you.
Thanks, Chair. I'll just confirm the members present again. Councillor Davies. Yes, present. Councillor Farmer. Present. Councillor Houston. I'm here. Councillor McPherson. <laughs> here. Councillor McGill. I'm here. And Councillor Thompson. Present. Okay, and that's everyone present. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, David. And we're reconvening item five on the agenda, which is the mixed use development comprising of offices, retail, gym, drive through, restaurants, car showroom, associate car park infrastructure at Crookbridge, south of Wix, north of Kirsch Road, Stirling. And Peter, this is obviously your application. Now, it's, this one again is a hearing, and I'm just going to outline the, the run order of the hearing, which is the introduction of the report by the planning officer presentation by the applicants, which is limited to five minutes, presentation by any supporter, which is again is limited to five minutes, and presentation by any objectors, again, which is limited to five minutes, and then it's questions and consideration by the panel. So, Peter, over to you to introduce the application. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter McKechnie. I'm the planning officer that processed the application. Peter, uh, Peter, can I stop you just look at the, the, the contributors not speak because we can hear you speaking in the background, please. OK, Peter. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a, a major application. It's a planning permission in principle that's been applied for, for a mixed use development comprising offices, class two and four, retail class one, drive through restaurant, car showroom and associated car parking and infrastructure and landscaping at land at Crookbridge to the south of Wicks and north of the Kersh Road, Stirling. Here we have the location plan that was submitted with the application. As you can clearly see, the site is outlined in red. Shows uh, the red line boundary, clearly forming the application site and the planning unit. The application site is not owned by the applicant. Um, it's owned by the Stir Stirling Development Agency uh, in conjunction with Stirling Council. Application site is located within the Spring Cares Mill Hall Commercial Centre and is allocated within the adopted local plan, primarily for household bulky goods. The red line site that you can see before you extends to 5.2 hectares and is currently uh, agricultural grazing ground, which you'll see in pictures that are to come. The site sits to the northwest of the roundabout junction of the A91 and A905, with the road and the roundabout raised, resulting in the site sitting below road levels, which you'll also see in, in pictures to come. The site falls to the north down to the Pell Stream Burn, which is at the northern boundary of the site. There's a relatively flat in that area there and then falls down to the north where the, the, Pell, the Pell Stream Burn or Town Burn is situated. To the south, there are existing car showrooms and the auction mark in this area here with access to the site is to be taken from a point opposite the access to, the, to these uh, showrooms and the auction mart. So access to the site is to be taken in this area here. Uh, beyond the barn to the north, you have Wicks and the, the Spring Cares uh, retail park. To the west of the site, in this here, you have a detached residential uh, property that bounds directly on to the site itself. The, the, the site also lies within a key portion of the Battle of Bannockburn site. And as set out uh, earlier there, the site is allocated within the LDP for retail, restricted to household bulky goods, but also allows for an element of commercial leisure use. And any proposals coming forward for the site must provide class four business. This is a, an aerial image of the site with the, the site outlined in, and shaded in red. Uh, you can see there's existing vegetation around the, the boundaries, Spring Cares area here to the north, and the A905 and A91 in these areas here. 
a car showroom and auction mark sitting to the south of the site. Here we have the submitted site layout plan. This is purely uh, an indicative layout um, because the application is obviously a, a planning permission in principle. We have proposed here a retail uh, food superstore, uh, which the applicants have indicated um, is to be a, an Asda superstore. Uh, we have a car showroom situated over here and drive through restaurant, uh, the class two to four business uses situated here to the north. And this area here is shaded out. It's not for, forming part of the application, uh, but it's potentially a future petrol station. The site has a, a gas main that runs directly through it, which has a, obviously had a, a significant impact on the, the layout that's been presented here as well. As you can see from the layout, there's quite a substantial amount of car parking that's proposed uh, for the for the proposed uses. But there is elements of open space, particularly around the boundaries with planting. Uh, but the majority of open space and planting is to the north of the site in, in this area here. As discussed there earlier, the site access is to be taken in this area here, directly opposite the access into the uh, auction mark and uh, other car showrooms. It's to be formed as a, a T-junction signal, signal controlled uh, junction. Uh, coming back to the car parking, uh, for the car showroom alone, uh, there's 378 spaces. As you can see from this layout, it, it doesn't show any uh, connection um, cycle or uh, pedestrian um, into the surrounding areas, particularly uh, to the north here for the uh, spring care into the spring cares um, retail park. However, it has been brought to our attention. And this is a positive uh, turn of events uh, that the agent they can get control of the land to the north. This land here uh, to form a pedestrian wheeling bridge across the water. However, the exact detail of this has not been discussed or worked out. Therefore, um, should members be of an opinion to approve the application today, um, it's advised that uh, the delivery of this is, is done through a negatively suspended condition um, that would require the detail of this to be approved uh, prior to the development commencing and then uh, for it to be uh, wholly uh, put in place before the occupation of any of the, the units. This is an image looking east to west across the site. The set, site, as discussed earlier, is relatively flat. As you can see, it falls down towards the, the Pearl Stream burn. And you can see the difference in levels between the main road and the site itself. It sits between three to five metres below the, the road level. You can see the, the, the castle in the distance there, which uh, would need to be considered as part of any detailed application that came forward views to the, the castle or a, a key aspect. This is another image of the site looking northwest um, towards the site from the A905, A921 roundabout. It's a greenfield site. Uh, you can see spring cares in the, in the background there and the house that is conterminous with the, the boundary of the, the site. This is a, an image taken from within the site itself, looking south, south east towards uh, the Pelstrian Burn and uh, the, the Wix uh, retail is, is seen there as well. This is a site, uh, sorry, a picture that's taken from uh, Wick, the Wix side of the, the site to the, to the north, looking south. Um, the Pelstrian Burn is just in this area here. You can see how the, the steepness of the slope coming down towards the, the burn. Moving on to the submitted sections, um, you know, as the, the application um, is in, in principle, these these are just given uh, indications of the of the heights that, that could be formed as part of a, a detailed stage. Um, 
you can see there's an intention for the the two store the what you call it the the class two class four office development business used to be a uh, three story uh, but also with a, a basement and um, so it's indicated as part of the sections here that overall this building could be between 15 to 20 meters in height and um, this here you have the the car showroom which is indicated as part of these sections to be uh, 10 meters in height also show that the site levels are to be between three to five uh, meters below the, the carriageway level. These further sections, you can see the, the height of the uh, proposed, the indicated height of the proposed uh, restaurant drive through. Although these were not updated for the change from the retail units to the uh, the supermarket, um, the outline of the building here is, or of the previous buildings is indicated, which is broadly in within the, the parameters of the, the proposed uh, supermarket as well. But again, though, this this would form part of any detailed application and, uh, and negotiated as part of that. You can see here as well that the proposals are also uh, intended to involve land raising to form the a flattened off part of the site where it was default where it currently falls down towards the the town burn here we have set out uh it's a high level master plan for landscaping there's no uh detail on terms of any particular uh, areas of specific types of planting but you would expect that this that's only a ppp application so grass and trees around uh, the perimeter uh, was meadow planting, etc. But the, the detail of that would be worked out through any planning conditions. Um, majority of the open space and sloping land, though, is, is to the is sorry, the majority of open space and planting is to the north here, um, where there's sloping land and uh, land that's subject to flooding. This indicates the extent of, or part of the extent of surface water drainage, uh, which will be uh, partly dealt with through permeable paving. So the, the large areas of, of car parking will also um, help to attenuate and, and mediate the, the, the water. This is the part of the site where uh, the access is to be formed directly opposite the, the existing access into uh, Arnold Clark and the, and the auction mark. Uh, this sets out the uh, public transport um, available within the, the area, and as you can see, the, the site is serviced by by the by bus. This is the the Toucan crossing um, that will be uh, removed as part of the proposals, uh, and currently serves the the national uh, cycle network. Here we have the extent of uh, core paths showing within uh, the local route showing within the area um, that surround the site or, or lead up towards the actual site itself. And that ends my presentation. Thanks very much. OK, thanks for that, Peter. Move to the second part of the, the hearing, which is the presentation by the applicants. And we've got here, I think, Robin Holder that's actually speaking on behalf of the applicant. Also in attendance, we've got Keith Hargess from Hargess Planning, Stuart Harrow from DBA, Jim Turnbull and Ross Stewart from Ramoyle Developments. Peter, the screen's kind of went black there. Can you min minimise or can I remove that, please? OK, that's fine, thank you. OK, uh, so Mr Holder, you've got five minutes and I'll, ask, I'll tell you after four minutes to, to start summing up if you want to start your presentation, please. Thanks, convener. Um, my background, I'm a planning consultant and a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute for some 33 years. Uh, as you mentioned, with me is Keith Hargist and he's one of the most experienced and respected retail planning experts in Scotland. We've got Stuart Harrow, who's a transport planning expert, and Jim Turnbull and Russell Stewart of Ramoyle, uh, which is a, a building-based company. 
So the application is for a mix of uses, uh, but it's the food store that is causing most of the concern for your planning officers. Your LDP allocates the site for retail and office uses. Uh, so it's the type of retailing that causes concern, a food store rather than bulky goods. However, the panel report acknowledges there is no likely prospect of bulky goods of a bulky goods retailer locating here because of the large oversupply of such premises. Uh, and it's also notable that the council, through its property arm, the SDA, marketed the site for a food store. Uh, and we assume it would have been standard practice for this to have been agreed with planning officers. Respectfully, the planning report is not correct on some key points relating to retail planning policies and best practice relating to retail assessments. That's perhaps understandable given the specialist nature of the topic, uh, and I'm sure that your planning officers would, would concede they're, they're not necessarily experts in the subject. We did request a meeting between our experts, the hardest, and the council's consultant, but regrettably that was declined. So let me summarise some key points, and this is a real summary. Um, the council's consultant is not saying that the food store will have a harmful impact on Stirling City Centre. Rather, he's saying that our retail impact assessment doesn't prove that it won't. And, and that conclusion, in our very strong opinion, is, is wrong. The assessment is highly robust, undertaken fully in line with Scottish guidance and utilising the most up-to-date information. Uh, the council, council consultant's main criticism is that the assessment uh, does not include a recent household survey of shopping patterns. However, it's important that you note that a household survey is not essential for a robust assessment and, and nor is it is the requirement. Uh, moreover, it's been impossible to undertake a reliable household survey uh, since the COVID pandemic started. Uh, the Council's consultant disputes this because some surveys have been undertaken by others during the pandemic elsewhere. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't mean that those surveys are necessarily reliable. Uh, and you should know that the vast majority of these have been in England, where restrictions have obviously been less than Scotland. So in our view, it's not credible to suggest that shopping, uh, a survey of shopping habits during the pandemic, when so many people have been working from home and with you know, other restrictive uh, guidance, uh, it really can't be relied upon to predict shopping patterns for when normal times return. The approach that Mr Hardest has taken of sensitivity testing is much more reliable and is recommended by Scottish Government research. Unsurprisingly, the retail assessment demonstrates that the proposed food store in Asda will not have a significant impact on trading in the city centre. Instead, as one would expect, it shows that the Asda will compete with Tesco, Sainsbury's and Morrison's, but not to the extent that it threatens their viability. The panel report says the food store is contrary to the LDP because it's contrary to policy 2.6 for tier F uh, that refers to bulky goods. Uh, respectfully, uh, that's wrong because the proposal complies with LDP policy 2.7, which allows non-bulky goods retailing if it can be shown that it doesn't harm the centre. So in our view, the application does comply with the LDP. The panel report suggests that the proposed food store fails the sequential test because the proposal could be broken down into a number of smaller local food stores. And that, respectfully, I'm afraid is wrong and contrary to Scottish uh, case law uh, through judgments, which requires the single sequential test to be applied to the proposal in hand and not to a smaller proposal. It also misses the point that the applicant has demonstrated a need for the Start food store. Start to sum up, please, Mr Holdy, you have a minute left. As quickly as I can. It also misses the point that the applicant has demonstrated a need for a food store of this size in this location. The panel report criticises the development for being car dominated. That is very unfair in our view. Firstly, the car parking numbers are required by the Council's own planning policies and standards uh, for this retail and office allocated site. And there is no objection from your roads department. Secondly, by definition, food shopping is less reliant on car borne customers than bulky goods, which need to be transported, obviously. And importantly, in terms of enhancing active travel opportunities, as Mr McKechnie was saying, land has now been secured from the SDA to achieve the pedestrian bridge and wheeling bridge across uh, the Tyneburn Spring Curse. And that includes uh, access to the nearby park and ride. So finally, uh, we note that there have been only two objections to the revised proposals that we're aware of. And we presume that's a reflection of the fact that the non-food retail units that might have competed with the city centre have been removed from the proposal. So that concludes my presentation. Somewhat constrained by time, and we would certainly have questions, and we can expand on any matters. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Holder. And uh, next section of the hearing is presentation by any supporters, and we have Alan McIntosh 
from the John Clark Motor Group. Mr McIntosh, again, if you can limit your presentation to five minutes, and again, I'll give you the nod after four minutes, if a minute left. Do you want to proceed? Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And firstly, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Alan McIntosh. I am the Group Finance Director of John Clark Holdings Limited, which is the lead company for the John Clark Motor Group. I'm also the company secretary of all of our subsidiary companies, including Morrison Land Rover Limited, which I think most of you will recognise is, is the long-standing Jaguar Land Rover franchise holder in Stirling. I'm here in support of the planning application submitted by the Model Developments for the site of Coop Road Stirling. I can also confirm that John Clark Motor Group has agreed terms to purchase a section of the Crookbridge site from Romoral Developments Limited, which would become the new location for our state-of-the-art Jaguar and Land Rover car showroom in Stirling. As you may know, Morrison's is a long-standing business and employer in the Stirling area, with some 75 locally-based colleagues already employed. Plus, this number is expected to grow once we relocate the Jaguar Land Rover business. However, you may not know that the premises we currently occupy on Glasgow Road no longer meet franchise agreement brand standards for both Jaguar and Land Rover. Furthermore, the growing importance of electric vehicles needs to be supported from a modern facility with the required infrastructure which cannot be provided at the current location. The manufacturer stipulations are that within the next two to three years, the majority and Land Rover of Jaguar and Land Rover ranges will have migrated to a hybrid or pure electric car offer, which will require a far higher electricity supply to the site. As such, the Jaguar and Land Rover products will become amongst the most eco-friendly in the car industry. For these reasons, it is our intention to relocate and deliver an all-new purpose-built facility that can support the growth in electric vehicle volumes and provide an exceptional experience to all of our valued local customers. In our opinion, the most appropriate location for car showrooms in Stirling is Kers Road, as demonstrated by the number of other car retailers that already operate dealerships there. Morrison's is under considerable time pressure to secure new franchise agreement compliant premises. To best serve the interests of our customers and colleagues, we wish and hope that this will be a crook bridge. Otherwise, regrettably, we might soon face a position beyond our control, where we may be forced to look at alternative locations which may or may not be in Stirling. We are very conscious that our proposals are part of a wider package, including the relocation of another local employer, Stirling Stone, and a new Asda food store, food store. And we understand that this application will be considered as a whole. On this basis, we wish to record to the panel that the planning matters you have before you today, in our opinion, appear entirely reasonable to Morrison's. Quite simply, in our view, the applicant is proposing the development of a long vacant council-owned site that is already allocated for a mix of employment and business uses, including retail. They have submitted compelling arguments, as well as comprehensive and robust reports that show that the proposed uses will not compete with the city centre, which I believe is the principal issue here. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly, they have produced reliable economic estimates indicating that there will be approximately net 250 new full-time jobs created, and that doesn't include the likely additional jobs at Morrison's, or indeed construction jobs during the build period for the development as a whole. In our view, this is a significant investment which shows great confidence in the city. On this basis, we fully support the current application. Before the a, minute, a minute left, Mr McIntosh. Thank you. Perfect. My last sentence is, on this basis, we fully support the current application before the Council and hope that a consent will be granted. Thank you. OK, thanks very much for that. The, oops, and the, Next section of the hearing is presentation by objectors. Now, there isn't any objectors to this application, so I'm just going to move straight to questions from panel members to council officer and any of the contributors to the hearing. OK, so questions, Councillor Farmer? Yeah, just to, for the avoidance of doubt, I mean, obviously, um, our uh, officers have uh, referred to the 
household shopping survey in 2008 as being very dated, which is uh, obviously it is. Um, and I'm just uh, would like uh, the applicants um, retail expert to uh, give me some assurance that the sensitivity testing that's been carried out is a robust and recognised process. Um, and is that process um, uh, to supplement uh, the uh, 2008 uh, survey or uh, to enhance the 2008 survey, in other words, to bring it up to date, just so that I can have that, that assurance, please. <clears throat> can I check that everyone can hear me OK? Yep. Is that Sorry. Mr Hargis? Uh, yeah? Yes, this is, uh, this is Keith Hargis. I'm uh, Director of Hargis Planning Limited, um, and I'm the, the retail expert. Um, prepare the retail impact assessment. So the question relates to the, the household survey and the assurance related to the sensitivity testing. Um, first thing I should say is that the household survey was um, the original one, the 2008 surveys, which were used for studies undertaken for the council in the period 2008 to 2012, was used as a, a, as a starting point um, for our assessment of existing turnover um, level was in the city centre and other retail locations. But these have been supplemented by up to, completely up-to-date information relating to um, <clears throat> existing available expenditure provided by um, data organisations, those are um, precisely in Oxford economics uh, forecasting. Um, fully up-to-date information on floor space from surveys undertaken in the early part of 2021. Um, completely up to date expenditure forecasting um, from the same data organisations, up to date population forecasts provided by um, National Record Scotland uh, for small areas and so on. Um, so that household information was part of the inputs. Um, in addition for assessing uh, turnover, we looked also looked at uh, national average sales densities for um, all the principal retailers uh, within the city and within the catchment area. And that's provided by the uh, organization called Retail Rankings and they produce re reports every year. So we've looked at 2020 and 2021 data for that. So it is part of the process. Um, you know, it, it's not the, the, the sole information source for looking at um, key information for the retail assessment. It's one part of a number of um, number of inputs. But in order to test the sensitivity test and to undertake the sensitivity testing, we actually changed the assumptions quite radically. Um, so probably the key issue uh, for looking at the city centre is what is the turnover of the city centre? Now, we've made an estimate from those sources, but... If, for example, the turnover of the city centre is 25% less than now, um, that would lead to a higher impact. So we tested that. We included that within the impacts. Um, we did the same for other key variables in the retail impact assessment and rather go through them in detail. But the main point is that even though the, you know, the, the central case for retail impact we identified in the city centre was between 2 and 3% loss, um, loss of trade, if you apply very wide-ranging sensitivity impacts, the range of potential effect on the city centre is between minus 1% and minus 4%. And the main reason for that is the fact that the vast majority of the turnover of the city centre is, is uh, comparison goods and not convenience goods as sold in the supermarket. That's not to say that there aren't supermarkets in the city centre. Of course, there are. We've got Waitrose and we've got um, Little. But the key driver of the turnover of the city centre um, is relating to general comparison goods. And these are not being sold to any significant degree in the proposed superstore. Um, and that is why the, the impacts, even with very wide ranging sensitivity tests, are really quite small. OK, do you want to come back to that, Councillor Farmer? Are you happy with that answer? I'm quite happy with that answer, uh, Chair. OK. Okay, can, can I can I ask Mr. Holder in in, in relation to the, the the full site here? Obviously, it's maybe that I want to speak to Ramoyle as well. But the the, the whole issue you, you mentioned, uh, Peter Keckney mentioned that as they're coming in there, um, I, th I think about the, the how many jobs is this full site going to create? Is that, is that information available? Yeah, so. The, the full number of jobs on site, and we've used uh, a reliable source uh, for this information, 
is likely to be five and six hundred uh, full-time equivalent jobs. Having said that, a number of those jobs uh, will be uh, relocated jobs. Uh, and our estimate between the various uses, there'll be approximately 250 new full-time equivalent jobs, completely new jobs. And can that's no, Mr. I'm oh, sorry, on you go. No, it's okay. That's 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 fine. Yeah, Mr. Turnbull and Mr. Stewart, obviously from Remoyal. Obviously, obviously, your business is Sterling Stone. Is is it, is it your plans to move your operation there as well? Yes, we the office head office. We would be relocating to Cribridge, but not any manufacturing facility that would still be located in a, a more appropriate situation, but we've been looking for new premises for some five years. Uh, we're in lease premises that are really coming to end of life. Yeah, that's what I was kind of wondering if you're manufacturing, because I was wondering how compatible that would have been with the other proposed usages, you know, so, so your manufacturing would remain elsewhere then, yeah? It would. To be honest, the manufacturing process there is a fairly clean process now, and it could be compatible, but it's not our intention to put onto that side. Okay, and Mr. Macken, sorry, Mr. Macintosh from John Clark Motor Group. Obviously, you see your your current garage is in Glasgow Road and Windsor Milton. And what what happened to that building? Presumably, it would be closed down or reused elsewhere. Sort of a re well, re sorry, we're, you we're, com we're currently trying to assess um, two or three different options there, including potentially simply re-franchising it with another motor trade brand, um, but we are also starting to explore alternative development uses. So, so in essence, there's a chance that you're, that, that there'd be extra jobs created through this thing in the motor industry yes. sector things, yeah? Okay. Yes, there is. We, we would hope to attract another franchise and put it as a backfill into that site, but unfortunately we've, we've as yet been unable to secure that um, additional franchise because we clearly we, we cannot yet offer a timeline as to when facilities might or might not be available. Okay. Uh, apologies for jumping about here, Mr Holder. But I think, what would you say the whole development value here, this potential, all these, all these various usages are, the full development value of this site? It, it might be Mr Turnbull can add to it, but my, my understanding is that the total investment will be in the order of £20 million. Pounds. Okay. That, okay. that, that's, correct. that's correct. It's £20 million in investment in the buildings. But over and above that, you will obviously have the operator fit-out investment as well, and significant both for John Clark and Asda. Okay, thanks for that, gentlemen. Uh, Councillor Thompson? Yeah, a couple of points, Chair, if I may. Um, the, the, the point was made uh, about the, the 2008 survey, but since then, obviously, we've had Debenhams closed, for example, and uh, the need to keep businesses within the, the city centre, and that's part of government uh, policy. Um, this, this is to ask that, and then I'll come on to another point, if I may. Um, did you look at, at alternative sites within the Stirling area? Uh, I'll maybe take that initially, it's Robin Holder here. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, indeed we did, and uh, planning policy requires a what's called a Potential test to be uh, undertaken, and I suppose simply put, that means that if there is a site suitable for what you are proposing uh, in a town centre, a defined town centre in a plan or an edge of centre site, then uh, that uh, potentially is preferable sequentially. So generally speaking, you would have concerns as an authority if there was such a site available. Uh, and I think your planning officers agree uh, that our sequential assessment shows that uh, there is no uh, suitable site. And um, uh, the, 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 the demand, I'm afraid, is, is, is not suitable for this combination of uses. And I'm, I'm not sure that would be the right place at all for it. Uh, and I'm, I, I don't think your, your planning officers disagree with that. Well... Can I ask the planning officers that very question? That uh, we're looking at this as one entire development, but if you split it down into a car showroom, uh, drive-through, etc., uh, it it can be looked at entirely differently. Can I ask the planners 
uh, and me mention is made of the, the, the step site, for example. Does that argument hold fire if we only look at this uh, as a, um, a supermarket? Peter McKay there, Mike McGrew, or who wants to pick that one up? In terms Chris? of... I think the questions for the planning officer, Councillor yeah. Thompson, doesn't yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, the, the point's been made that it's, it's got to be sequential. You look at uh, centre of town, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but the applicant yeah. and, and the reply suggested we've got to look at it as a whole, a car showroom, etc. It's the component parts I would like to understand better. Sorry, I'll take that. Yeah, so the sequential approach only applies to the retail aspect. It doesn't apply, apply to the, the totality of the development. So um, we, I agree with the applicant that, uh, sorry, my dog is yapping in the background. I hope nobody can hear that. Um, <laughs> um, we agree with the applicant that uh, looking at the retail proposal for a superstore, uh, that there are no alternative sites within um, the Stirling area that could accommodate that uh, footprint of, of Food superstore. Uh, Mr. Holder's referred to some legal case law. In actual fact, the legal case law is more mixed than what he's indicated. So there is an expectation as well that, that in looking at the sequential approach, that there is um, that the, both the council and the applicant apply some um, reality and pragmatism, but also on the applicant's part, some flexibility in looking at their proposals in a manner um, that doesn't necessarily exactly meet the lower print that's available within the city centre but could be could be adapted uh, reasonably and practically. Our considerations on this matter are more complicated than just out ruling out that there's no uh, other sites for a retail format uh, superstore because of the weakness that we the underlying weakness that we find throughout all of the policy or a number of the policy requirements around about looking at uh, what we do and do not know about retail patterns in Stirling and the fact that the survey is um, 2008 based and things have changed so much, that lack of knowledge doesn't just apply to the retail impact assessment, but also applies to us knowing, not knowing if there is any gaps in the food retail market and what that gap may be. So, for example, we do not do not know if the what's being provided at this site could actually be provided um, in smaller formats, such as like a Tesco Metro or a, a Sainsbury local. So, um, it's I'm giving you a, not a straightforward black and white answer there, um, but again, our we've not been able to rule out that the sequential approach has been met because, again, of our lack of knowledge as to exactly what is going on in the retail environment. Uh, OK, I think I think that, that that kind of answers the question that uh, the 2008 survey, etc., needs needs uh, a, a review. The, the other question I would like to ask, Chair, uh, and uh, Brayhead and Broomridge Community Council have, have objected um, and have made the point that it's uh, a substantial distance from um, any any of the, the housing sites. Excuse me. Was any consideration given to providing public transport links dedicated to the site, given the, the fact that it's not going to be able to uh, be accessed through cycling and, and uh, pedestrian routes? Mr. Mr. Harrell. Yeah. yeah. Hi, hi there. Yeah. Um, no, no dedicated provision for public transport, i.e. dedicated from surrounding areas, um, was considered um, as, as identified in the, the planning officer's view. Public transport does serve the site. It doesn't necessarily serve the site from every single uh, residential uh, area within Stirling, but there is access to the site by public transport. Um, I, I would tend to agree with some of the observations in terms of active travel and as far as that the site is located within an existing pedestrian network and cycle network, National Cycle Route passes directly to the west of the site 
and the development act of uh, access proposals include for the relocation of the cycle crossing of Kerr's Road to be incorporated into the site access. But in direct to answer to, to, to the question, there, there has been no dedicated uh, public transport considered from surrounding areas to the development site. Okay, any further questions? Nope, if there's no further questions, the recommendations contained on page 111, one to four, which is to refuse the application. Does anyone want to move, anyone want to move the recommendation to refuse the application for the reasons outlined? Councillor Thompson? Okay, seconded by Councillor McGill, is it? Okay. Is there anyone otherwise minded? Councillor Farmer? Yeah, I would like to um, uh, to move to uh, be minded to approve uh, the plan and application in principle. Um, and I've got the reasons that I can go through, Chair. Um, okay. To me, um, the application fundamentally rests uh, around the LDP policies uh, 2.6 and 2.7. Uh, to me, the proposal would not adversely impact on policy 2.6. There is already a, a food a superstore in Spring Cares, and the additional proposal would enhance the offering to the people of Stirling and provide significant economic uh, benefit that has been uh, alluded to. Uh, page 124 at 2.75 acknowledges uh, that there is uh, a likely oversupply of land and premises uh, reserved for bulky goods. Uh, so therefore, the proposal, in my view, would not fundamentally alter uh, the role and function of Spring Cares and Mill Hall uh, Commercial Centre. I would advocate conditions uh, to remove permitted development rights of any Class 2 units and also conditions to ensure Class 1 supermarket use in relation to primarily uh, for foodstuffs. I would also uh, consider uh, the proposal uh, would uh, not have a detrimental impact on the vitality of the town centre. Uh, while acknowledging that the 2008 survey is dated, uh, the addition of the uh, sensitivity testing uh, that illustrated that even with a worst case scenario of a 10% decrease in turnover, the impacts would be marginal uh, with an increase of 1% in terms of, of impact on retail, as detailed on page 122 at 2.62. In terms of policy 2.7, I believe the sequential test has been met uh, as what is before us uh, is mixed use development, including a superstore. At page 126 at uh, 2.82, it's agreed uh, that there is no alternative sites for a superstore of the scale proposed. And finally, in terms of the act of travel, I believe uh, that greater connectivity and modal shift with a condition to, uh, 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 to, to deliver the pedestrian and cycleway over the proposed bridge structure for utilities can be dealt with through the detailed a phase of the planning process at page 139 at 2.167, um, which highlights that that would address the, the, the issue of the connectivity problems um, as highlighted uh, uh, and deal with the act of uh, travel uh, proposal. So I therefore uh, move that we um, uh, approve the planning uh, permission and principle. Thank you. Okay. Okay, before I ask Chris Cox to just double check that he's a robust plan reason, I'm looking for a seconder for Councillor Farmer. Councillor Davis? Yeah, I'll, I'll second Councillor Farmer for the reasons he's quoted. Okay, Chris, can I just check that these are robust and sufficient and adequate planning reasons for going against officer recommendations? Uh, thank you, Chair, and you're correct um, that uh, the reasons required to, to fulfil both of those requirements, one, that they are robust and uh, relate to planning matters, uh, and also that they're sufficiently articulated. Um, <clears throat> so on both of those matters, uh, I, I, I do consider that, that um, those requirements have been met. 
I would, however, uh, just caution around the the reasoning linked to economic benefit. Uh, that's a very um, <clears throat> tall order to be able to justify. Uh, you need to be able to say that it's net benefit and you need to have demonstrable evidence in, in front of you. Uh, but aside from that, the, the other reasoning that you, you ran through are, um, are, are, are reasonable planning reasons. Okay. OK, I'm going to hand it over now to the clerk to just to carry out the vote now. OK, thanks, Chair. So just to confirm, we have the uh, recommendation to refuse for the reasons stated, moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor McGill. And we have the amendment to approve the application for the reasons set out uh, as moved by Councillor Farmer, seconded by Councillor Davies. So voting first on the amendment, uh, which is the motion to approve from Councillor Farmer. Please indicate for or against or not voting. Councillor Davies. Yeah, I'll vote for the amendment. Councillor Farmer. For. Councillor Houston. For. Councillor McPherson. For. Councillor McGill. Against. And Councillor Thompson. Against. OK, so the amendment's carried by four votes to two and becomes a substantive motion. So just voting again on that substantive motion to confirm the panel's decision. Councillor Davies. Sorry, yeah. Um, why, why should we voting? We're not voting on the recommendation. Sorry, Sorry no, the, the amendment has now become the substantive motion. So we oh, now vote, just... Yeah, vote, yeah, vote for that. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Farmer. For. Councillor Houston. For. Councillor McPherson. For. Councillor McGill. Against. And Councillor Thompson. Against. OK, and the substantive motion is carried by four votes to two. Thanks, Chair. OK, and the application is then approved. OK, so do we want to continue? Well, there's a need to have a, maybe a five minute recess. Do members want a, a longer than a five minute recess? Are there two applications to go? Do they want 15 minutes? Ten minutes. Ten uh, minutes. Yeah. I, I, I think, think it's only only fair on the on the staff Good, that we, we have a, a longer now break. Exiting. Yeah. Okay. Is now exiting. So ten minutes okay, Dumb, everybody? Dumb, Dumb. Can I suggest fifteen? Is now yeah. exiting. Okay. Right, let's go for fifteen minutes. That's the come back at the let me see that's thirteen that's forty. Okay. Thank you. Is now
I will do. Thanks, Chair. Just to confirm the members present again, Councillor Davies. Yes, present. Councillor Farmer. Present. Councillor Houston. Present. Councillor McPherson. Here. Councillor McGill. I'm here. And Councillor Thompson. Present. That's everyone. Thanks, Chair. OK, we reconvene at item six on the agenda. It was extension of mineral extraction operations and construction of conveyor bridge at Canvas Moore House, Doon. Ian Jeffrey, this is your application? Yes. OK, do you want to proceed, please? Yep, well, I'll do. I'll just open up the PowerPoint presentation. Can you all see that? Can you yep. view the we'll see it? Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I can't control that again. Okay. Uh, the application is for the extension of mineral extraction operations and construction of conveyor bridge, including site restoration at land south of Campus Moore House, Doon. The applicants are Campus Moore Trust Estate and Breeden GB Mineral Limited. The application is for a major development. The site is located in a rural area approximately 800 metres to the southeast of Calendar. You can see Calendar there just to the north and is bound to the east by the A84 trunk road. That's the alignment in red there. Uh, the application site is here is in this map is um, outlined in red. Sorry. Um, sorry. Mm. And, and then that's it there. And then adjacent to the site, the to the, the west side surrounding it is a, a water feature called um, Kelty Water. The site area extends to uh, approximately 30 hectares, consists of mainly agricultural parkland for sheep grazing. The site is in regular shape and land form is undulating. So there's another picture of the site here, and um, plan of the site outlined in red, and then again below. And um, this shows you that um, again the A84 um, along the east side of the site, and the the application site there shows it as as part land with with the individual trees, and the healthy water um, next to the site. Um, this area well, keeps jumping away from me. This area here is the, the existing quarry. The area in red is the proposed quarry extension. Um, to the north of the site is Campus Moore House, and with estate offices for Campus Moore here, and a couple of houses just there where the arrow is. And across the road is Myrtle Woods. With a couple of houses as well. Um, the access to the site is to we'll use the existing access um, from the A84 along here and really adjacent to Balak Allen Farm. The will access through through the corner for trees uh, into the site. So that, you know, that's how the site will be accessed. The, the, the proposal also includes uh, a conveyor bridge. Uh, when they work this site, they'll transfer the, um, the worked materials of sand and gravel across uh, into the existing quarry for, for processing. The phasing will be done in four phases. You can see it's phases one, two, three, and four of the alignment there of the bridge. Um, this plan shows a phase one, which will be done 
um, is, is dry working. And then after this, we'll progress to phase two. And as it progresses to phase two, uh, so, uh, phase one changes from dry working to wet working. And then phase two, uh, you know, is, is dry working. So is, is there, in each phase, there'll be a, a two parts to it. There'll be dry working and wet working in each of the four phases. Dry working first, then work, wet working after it, and that will happen in each phase. This is the, the location of the conveyor bridge, um, really on the kind of southern part of the site and showing it uh, crossing the, the Kelty water. The conveyor bridge is by and large within the, the area belonging to North Lomond and Trostics National Park, eh, who also have a, you know, a planning application in for this. Eh, but there's, there's really is for the, the bridge and as well. That's the conveyor bridge there. Going to go back. I like that conveyor bridge there, the eh, elevation of it. So just to be clear on the bridge, that's just a sort of plan view of it. And that's where you know all the sand and gravel will get transported from the site uh, of the quarry extension over to the existing quarry. Now just to be clear, this is the this side here is the side where the quarry extension is proposed. So the up till about this point here in the banking, this will be the bit that's in the Stirling Council area. So that's that's how much of the bridge will be in the council's area, and then from a bit there onwards, is in the national park. So that's kind of how, how the breakdown is. Um, this plan here shows um, the water feature uh, and the restoration proposals, showing you know tree tree planting, uh, embankments, and in, in the water feature in the middle. That's the campus more house over there. So that there's going to be a you know, comprehensive rest restoration proposals falling uh, or have been carried out progressively as the work is is, is completed in phases. Um, right. All right, here we go. Uh, this is um, cross sections uh, of the works here, uh, showing um, my arrow in. Uh, that's the, the the top line that you've got there. The top horizontal lines you've got there, there, and there. In the different cross sections that shows the existing uh, ground levels and then the, the green sort of chain line broken line at the bottom that's the you know the area to which they'll quarry down to that's the kind of maximum depth you know to which they will extract the sand and gravel so it gives you an idea you know just you know they're going to be uh, digging down to or quarrying down to and then the, the area of blue is the area where it uh, will be the, the water level and that you've seen in the you saw in the previous plan for the restoration that's where the kind of you know the, the water feature would be that's the, 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 the ground water level for that that's a picture of canvas more house it's a c category c listed building and that's a picture of um looking out on canvas more house just in the foreground you see the garden ground the garden ground of Camus Moore House, then looking across to a sort of background, you've got the, that's the, the application site there with, with trees that's used for sheep grazing. And that's at the, the opposite end of the site from Camus Moore House, the sort of the southern end, looking back across. And you can see a, it's not flat land, it undulates. You can see the kind of the sort of um, the, the land form itself with different trees. So that gives you an idea of you know, what the site looks like. Um, and this one is, picture is taken from the west side of the site, uh, looking northwards really towards Calendar. And again, you're seeing trees. And this site is picture here, sorry, is, uh, again at the west side of the site with the Kelty water to the left hand side. And that's that, that viewpoint looks north, west. And that picture there, that's really, um, that's is the point in the, where the, the, the crossing would be for the, the conveyor bridge for transporting the sand and gravel. 
Uh, so this is the application site here, and the bridge will go across the river here, and then you know into the existing quarry site where we've got a, a plant already within an existing quarry. They'll just continue to use that for the processing of materials. Um, and just to confirm, sorry, I'm diving back up here. It's almost finished. Yeah, the existing quarries here, they do the, I mean, once the quarry material is transported over to the existing quarry, it's put on the, you know, the, the heavy goods lorries, it's transported as it, as it is just now, it's transported along this road uh, there uh, to the 84. And in most cases, they turn right, they uh, turn right down the 84 and bypass Doom and go back to Stirling to the motorway. And that's that, that's how it's uh, taken from the site to, to destinations. So the recommendation, uh, it's in the report for the uh, approval of the application. Um, the consultation replies are listed as uh, the two representations. The conditions include uh, a restoration bond uh, relating to um, site restoration and aftercare liabilities. That's the uh, uh, conclusion of my presentation. Okay, thanks for that, Ian. Open up now for questions from panel members. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, a couple of minor points. Um, uh, it, it's it's well out the way, but uh, I presume a, a noise survey was carried out and the operation of the bridge isn't going to impact on anybody. And secondly, the restoration work looks great, but like everything, you know, it's uh, it's 20, 30 years down the, down the way and circumstances change. So we did mention the bond, etc. Are we satisfied that we have uh, everything in place? Yeah, as regards noise, the um, environmental health were consulted on noise and absolutely no no issues regarding it. I don't, I don't think noise is going to be an issue at all from from any of the workers. <coughs> the, you know, it's not going to be a, a noisy operation, a, you know, affecting in housing in, in the local areas. So that, that, that was satisfied with environmental health and conditions applied a, in the recommendation to the regulate you know parameters of maximum noise. Um, in regards to the landscape, the restoration bond is a robust a condition. A, you know it's been agreed with the developer a, in, in the report and the recommendation for approval. And the, the next, rough, an estimate just now of a landscape bond to the value of two hundred and sixty-five thousand pounds, which we just received the other day. But that's that's subject to, to further consideration, but they are satisfied that the, the wording in the, in the condition for the bond is robust. Okay, okay. Ian, while, while we're on the subject, before that, Councillor McGillan here, obviously we had this issue about the bond at the Thrust Quarry in my ward here. Yeah. And, and you know, that basically we've now left an abandoned hole in the ground that floods. And, you know, yeah. so, so at the end of the day, and, and and that's not a valid planning reason, but you know, then they for to refuse this this one. But I just know what's happened down in Throsky and the point that Councillor Thompson made. Obviously, I see there is provisions in the conditions here to to actually amend the bond and such like. Are, are we confident that the proposed condition here, eleven eighty e, is the most robust way of? Making sure the bond covers all eventualities and future liabilities. Yeah, I think so. It's um, it's been considered uh, through legal ad advice you know, within the council, and we're satisfied that it's that it's sound, soundly worded. It's so it's been tested and used uh, as a you know bond wording elsewhere in other circumstances. Uh, so it's, it's not just it's, it's not been sort of. Um, Freshly worded for this case, it's been been used successfully elsewhere. So, um, I think that the, the bond, the sorry, the restoration work will be done, uh, you know, gradually as they go along. It's not it's not like they're going to sort of, you know, quarry the it's, you know excavate quarry the place to, you know, create a big hole then potentially you know 
fog off, you know what I mean, clear off. It's, it's not, I think it's going to be done, uh, you know, progressively as they go, th as, they, as they walk through the site. So, it's, it's like going to be the, uh, different. Sorry, sorry for cutting across you. And that's what was supposed to have happened at Throsk and, re and, and in practice it is not happening. So, what safeguard does the community have in there that they just go, don't continue without doing any restoration work? Because that's exactly what's happened at Throsk. What's what's to safeguard that not happening here? Yeah. Um, well, the, the the condition is the safeguard, um, I would say, and you know, there's a, there's a, the bond is the safeguard. Um, and I think that the credibility of the developer, you know, and as much as they're, they're restoring the the, the existing site, and, you know, that they're working on just now. So I think there's, there's you know, it's, it's not directly comparable, uh, you know, in terms of the, the personnel involved. OK, I've got Mark Easton's hand up, Mark. Uh, just to come in on the back of, of Ian, Councillor McPherson, in terms of the, the condition, I mean, ultimately the Council's planning authority in the event that the bond, for some reason, becomes unenforceable, could take immediate action to stop the operations um, at the proposed development, should members be minded to grant the application. Um, as, a, as a further um, back up, the, the bond will be reviewed by um, the, the legal team before it, it, it's approved. I've experienced of dealing with these in uh, previous roles at, at PKC and, and, and dealing with um, mineral extraction permissions. And the, what, what we've asked for, um, I think it's as robust as we can and certainly uh, get. The, the, there, is a, there is a review period because uh, the costs of these things can go go up uh, beyond the, the CPI in, um, level of inflation and, and they need to be put in, in for a, a period of time. The difficulty that the applicant might find is, is that um, although they would be willing to um, guarantee reinstatement for the, the lifetime of the uh, permission, the bond market, uh, which is a, the commercial market out, out with the applicant's control, um, responds differently and may only be willing to put these things into uh, place for uh, limited time periods, which I think it, it is the explanation for the um, the renewal period of, of, of every three years uh, for, for this one. But certainly um, having known of previous experiences where developers have defaulted on their obligations. In this uh, instance, the Council is acutely aware of these risks and has taken steps to, uh, as well as possible, prevent the, the reoccurrence of these. Okay. Chris and Mike, what are your hands up? I don't know who wants to go first. Thanks, I will. Um, yes, <clears throat> just to add to what Mark has been advising, um, the bond goes hand in hand with the condition, the condition 15, which requires a quarterly monitoring of progress of the quarry. So um, in in previous years, I, I meaning decades ago, consent to, to quarries didn't have that kind of twin pronged approach, maybe had a bond in place, but didn't have a active and dynamic conditions that ensure that the planning authority is kept up to date with what progress is happening and knows when to trigger requirements to have restoration put into place. Um, more modernised conditions such as the one we've got in, in condition 15 ensures that that happens. Uh, so um, I would hope that we've got a, a belts and braces approach there uh, and also within to advise within the planning team we've got an additional resource to be able to um, proactively monitor exactly these kinds of um, conditions where you've got a condition that's going to go on for a number of years and requires active monitoring to ensure compliance. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. And my final question for our Councillor McGillan here. Ian, in relation to 2.28 in the report of the Special Area of Conservation here, and obviously it says here, the applicant breeding is aware of their responsibilities regarding the licensing. Again, here's the monitoring for this. Yes, they'll be aware of their, their, their responsibilities, but do we actively monitor it or do we SNH monitor it? This is a real important issue. Yeah, um, well, I think that the, it's been found that the, the, the working in terms of the, the reports they submitted that there's going to be no impact. It's working far too far away from the Kelty Water, where there's the Atlantic Salmon, the Brook eh, River and Sea Lamprey. These are the you know, the conservation interest species that are in there. And it's 
I mean, you know, site visits could be carried out just to see that working is in order. Do you know what I mean? Just a sort of a uh, dropping by uh, the site, sort of monitoring that that sort of thing. Uh, and you know, but I think that there's n nothing that's been proposed is, is causing a concern to Nature Scott, formerly SNH. You know, is it, you know, this the safe working is proposed. They're working far too far away from the river in terms of the quarrying, and then you know, they're basically bridging across it. So you know, there's no, there is a, there's yeah, no but, concern. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, they can go, they can quarry under the water table, which can impact. It. I see, Chris, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think there is something that we need to consider here. Um, if you could give us delegated mind, if panels minded to approve de delegated authority to look at this again. Um, the, some developments um, require a clerk of works to submit an annual report to us on the habitat survey just to uh, keep us satisfied that the habitat isn't being uh, disturbed during the life of the, the development. And that might be something that on reflection uh, might be appropriate. But um, without speaking with uh, Ian um, across the, the panel discussion, uh, I, I think we need to have discussion ourselves. But if, if members are minded to approve, uh, if we could ask delegated um, authority to work that up. No, I, I, would, I would greatly appreciate that. Again, I, I do know the issues we've had down at Corrin under the water table, and you know, it does, it does impact on and wildlife and such like and and and, and, and fish so yeah you know, i would welcome that councillor mcgill thanks chair um i just i suppose following on for that what i was going to raise at 2.34 on page 152 um it talks about a fresh survey report needing to be carried out um as a pre-start species survey um so i just was really wondering how that is going to the outcome of that, how that's going to be recognised and how that's going to be able to be influenced in any way. Um, because if that comes up, you know, if that comes down saying a certain type of work shouldn't be done, how, how are we going to monitor that? Um, so, that, well, that's my first point. I've got another few, but I see somebody's got their hand up. Mike? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. It was just to come in on Councillor McGill's first point there. Um, so we do have Condition 6, which is a pre-start species survey. Um, so basically it's saying no work shall commence on site until a survey by a suitably qualified ecologist of all basically protected species is carried out in the findings of the survey with any proposals for mitigation and timescales for compliance submitted for the written approval of the planning authority. So in that event, should we carry, should the applicant carry out a pre-start species survey and find that indeed mitigation does need to be done, um, we do catch it by um, condition six. And we also do say as well, should there be evidence of animals using the trees be identified in the felling plans, they should be altered and appropriate licences should be sought from Nature Scott in advance of tree works, uh, tree felling works proceeding. So that's a standard um, out with the planning system that we're reminding the applicant there through condition that um, they, they will have licences to apply for. However, on the back of this is request that is something we can look at um, and again amend the wording um, and look at um, that uh, wording again um, and see if there's any need for um, ongoing um, clerk of works to supervise those. Yeah, thanks. I'm not, I'm not suggesting for a second that anybody's underhand, but a lot of this is reliant on the operator to provide this information. So I'm just wondering what independent um, scrutiny is going to be, you know, for the pre-start the pre -start, um, work, for example. So once we get back information, um, we do have some knowledge in-house in the council. We've got the council's biodiversity officer. The biodi biodiversity officer is usually involved in matters such as these where it goes kind of beyond the technical experience of planning officers. Um, so unless there is something very, very clear um, that we can um, decide ourselves in relation to published guidance, um, we would normally consult with the relevant uh, consultees and experts um, covering that um, section um, to make sure that the, the information submitted um, is, is one accurate and that we can agree to it. Um, and my second point was just about the trees that are felled. Obviously, the, the trees that are within that the outline you've got at the minute, um, but see the block of trees down near the road. I mean, that's quite a substantial amount of trees. Is that necessary for that to go as well? No, these are being kept. Uh, 
um, the, the, the easier we get. Yeah. So it's only going to be the trees that are in, in the sort of open space area that will be. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be all these trees. Um, and they're still keeping quite a few, you know, of them. Um, and it's not like you know, every last tree. Um, and I've, I've walked to site and looked at the trees that are going to be retained. So, that, you know, they're, I think that they carefully considered, you know, when they did the, the outline of the of the pond area, if you like, the restoration area, where it gives you an idea just where they're going to sort of, you know, dig, dig, dig the hole over four phases. Okay. Then, you know, there was, there was consideration given, you know, what trees would be kept as a kind of a like, periphery, you know, to mm -hmm. that, you know, to keep to keep a kind of a retainer setting, a, you know, to, to have something to, to start with. And I know that, yeah, they are planting 335 trees, but it, it's not like they're taking out every last tree within, within that area. That, that's, you know, that's not the case. OK, and just my last point. Um, how what's the length of this quarry? Because it says in two point three nine on page one five two, um, it will be sufficient to maintain Cambus Moor Quarry for four to five years. Is that the length of time it's going to be operating? Yeah, it's it's, it's a five year uh, phase. Uh, you know, so there's we we'll be, we'll be quarrying and then progressively doing a uh, restoration as well. But there's a a two year period at the end for of restoration and landscaping is, you know, at, at the end of it. So, um, but the actual, the working of the sand and gravel, the, you know, that, that kind of quarrying work will, will be a five year period. Yeah. And so I know this isn't part of this application, but the existing quarry, what's what's going to happen to that? Would that is that going to be restored as well? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that been getting restored for a number of years now. And uh, that's, you know, that that is, under, under restoration, uh, you know, it's been that, that's within the um, Loch Lomond and National Park, Trossachs National Park site. So, but it's um, I have been into it and stuff like that and had to look around. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's getting worked and restored, but that's sort of coming to coming to an end, in, you know, quite soon in terms of its, uh, you know, the, the materials available for for working. But that that has been subject to restoration. Quite extensive restoration. Okay, thank you. Councillor Farmer. Yeah, just um, uh, seeking assurance that uh, we are confident that the design and specification of uh, the, uh, the 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 bridge going over the water um, yeah. is robust enough because obviously the very nature of these conveyor belts um as i've seen in building sites and in uh, obviously in, in pits etc that you get quite a lot of debris and given that it's it's sand and gravel which is very fine um mm -hmm. there would be a concern that that there may be the danger of of leakage into the kelty water and i was just seeking assurance that the actual especially the actual part of the conveyor that's going over the water is is of, of of such a design as to ensure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean it's uh, the there's there's two two phases of the uh, working. Um, there's two there's, there's dry working, there's wet working within the four four phases, and the, obviously the, the, the dry stuff you know above the water table, the, the, the groundwater level is. You know, that that will be loaded onto the conveyor bridge and transported across Kelty water to be processed. So the, the sort of dry stuff is just kind of like okay, and um, the, the wet stuff below the, the groundwater level table, um, that's a stock piled up and left to sort of dry out as it were, a, and then then it's sort of loaded onto to the conveyor bridge. So it's you know consideration. Is, is, is given to you know be properly transporting across the river. Okay, the, if there's no further questions or no further hands up here, the recommendations on page one four three to amend it, obviously subject to the obviously the point that I raised and Councillor McGill raised about ecology and and the uh, monitoring. So, are, are, are panel members happy to approve that? We go with the recommendation, page 143. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Is there anyone, anyone otherwise minded? No amendments? No. OK, so that one's unanimously approved. Move to the last item on the agenda, which is item seven, the designated parking facility at Gertcarn Filters Cottage in Fintry. And Mike, uh, what you or Sarah is going to be doing this one? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so I will be introducing the report and Sarah as the case officer on hand to um, provide some uh, detailed um, information on the case, should there be questions. Um, if you just give me a second, sorry, I'm just locating the presentation. And can I just check everyone can see that? Yep. Yep. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I will introduce this report, but the case officer, Senator Maguire, will be able to answer questions on a proposal, should panel have any. The creation of a designated parking facility within uh, Woodland and involves the upgrading of an existing track with passing places and the formation of a new link path from the car park to the existing footpath network. The site is currently forested land and lies east of the Gartcarden filters. This slide shows the overall site plan in relation to the existing buildings. Here you can see the upgraded um, road from the, the public road here that leads in to the car park and we have here the uh, link path to the existing path network. This slide here shows the car park in a bit more detail. As outlined in the report, the car park will be a formal car park for 50 vehicles set within areas of native woodland planting and fuller landscaping for screening. Um, at this point, I'd like to draw members' attention to there being a typo in the report at section 2.10. Um, there will be 42 car parking bays, not 22. We apologise for that error. Um, so just to go into some more detail here, you'll see that it's a linear arrangement for the car park and uh, disabled parking bays here. This is the um, substantial areas of native woodland planting that is being proposed. And this is an area of existing semi-natural woodland um, to be underplanted with native species. Just a few images now for site context. This image shows the existing access looking into the site from the public road. This image is further in, moving towards the proposed car park along the proposed new access road. This one is from within the site facing east, looking towards the structure planting. This is another view looking in the, the same direction. This one is facing northeast from within the site. And finally, this image shows the route for the proposed link path. Um, and at the end of this is the existing path network. This concludes my presentation. As per the report, officer's recommendation is to approve, subject to conditions. OK, thanks for that, Mike. Uh, open up now for questions. <laughs> questions, Councillor Davis. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Are there any plans to charge for the car parking? And are there any plans to put in uh, electrical vehicle charging points? Is it's going to be surrounded by windmills? So. Uh, we got an opportunity to offer free electricity to anybody who wants to get, walk around there. Sarah, um, so it's... Oh. Yeah, I'm Sarah, sorry, hello. Um, so I don't think there's any intention to charge <coughs> car parking um, at this point. And at present, they don't have um, the infrastructure to put in car parking charger, um, electric vehicle charging points. Um, However, I think in the future, if there's a demand, there's the potential for the car park to be expanded, where they would maybe look into this. Um, but obviously, that's not part of this application. Well, I would certainly be keen, A, to have charging, because it's a, a major problem in this part of the world, is, is getting um, dealing with parking and, and charging just gives you that revenue then to, to increase that capacity. And I think EV charging is the way forward and place like this where people can leave their car for a couple of hours and go for a walk. It's an ideal time to recharge. OK, points made, Councillor, uh, Councillor Davis. Councillor McGill. Yeah, I just I wasn't very clear why this car park was needed. 
just wondered if somebody could answer that. And also, again, about the trees. So trees are going to be destroyed. And it says on page 169, uh, 2.31, the applicant has advised a tree survey will, is being undertaken. But what influence, again, is that going to have on this application? You know, when, 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 when does that information then influence what happens? Sarah, do you want to come back on that? Um, yeah. So I think at the minute, a lot of people are parking along the road, um, just further along from the proposed car park, um, and it's creating some safety concerns, so potentially um, an incident on the road. Um, so they want to create a formal parking area for people, which um, will be safer. Um, and then the tree survey, they have um, sent this to me, but it was after the report was submitted for panel. Um, and it's basically to show which trees will be removed on site. And then there's also the condition for landscaping. So it's expected that the trees that are, are removed will be replaced through revised landscaping. OK, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with this area at all. Is it purely intended for, for walkers or are there cycle paths, etc., that um, may need some cycling facilities there? Um, so it's the Meekle Bin walking route, and I think people do can use it for cycling as well. And um, the car, the proposed car parking does involve um, cycle bays as well um, for people to use. OK, C can I ask Chris uh, Cox here, in relation to the point Councillor Davis made about electric charging points, would it be possible to put a, a, a suspensive condition or some kind of condition on you know, when, if and when the infrastructure is there that these can be done retrospectively? Is there any, any way of... Um, yeah, right. So at the moment, this is something that um, we're not fully really able to deal with under the planning system um, fully. Um, however, how we've been approaching it in the Council in the last couple of years, given members' concerns around about this, is to re re request from applicants that they submit an EV charging strategy to us, um, which <clears throat> requires our approval. So it provides the applicant with some flexibility as to how they go about actually um, a providing the EV charging. What I don't know, though, is practically how easy or difficult it might be to put in EV charging points here. Uh, so I think that condition would probably be robust because we're asking for a strategy to be brought forward to us. If the outcome of that, that strategy <clears throat> proved that it's just at this time not possible for or feasible for the applicant to put it in, then it, it would still be a robust condition. But it, it, at least we're um, we're kind of pushing the boundary on it, and uh, we're trying to achieve what we can achieve. So we, so we could, so we could, if we're going to approve this, we could add that condition onto yeah. it. Just to, mm -hmm. so that that's fine. Mm -hmm. that, I think that'll please everybody. To be honest with you, any any, any further questions? No. The uh, recommendations in page one six three, which is to approve it, obviously with the additional condition that Councillor Davis was looking to get done. Yep. And so, are panel members happy with that? Agreed. 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 Okay, so that's it. That's the close of business. Thanks for everybody's time today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone. Cheers.